Sometimes you have to see to believe and witness history as it unfolds. When the news is breaking, watch with the newsroom of The Washington Post. We explain what's happening and why it matters. Thank you for choosing to watch the headlines as they're being written by our journalists. You can subscribe with a special offer at WashingtonPost.com slash watch. Subscribing through that link lets everyone here from the front lines to the control room know that you care about our continued efforts to inform the public, protect the First Amendment, and foster a healthy democracy. We could not do this without you. The Russian military has begun a brutal assault on the people of Ukraine. Without provocation, without justification, without necessity, this is a premeditated attack. Putin chose this war, and now he and his country will bear the consequences. Omicron and all the variants have had a profound impact on the psyche of the American people. But the only way we put it behind us is if more Americans get vaccinated. And if we were to ever experience unchecked inflation over the long term, that would pose a real challenge to our economy. Madam Speaker, the President of the United States. President Biden delivers his first State of the Union address tonight. It comes amid a war in Europe, two years into a pandemic, and at a time when Americans are worried about inflation and money, even as the economy shows signs of growth and health. This is a special report from the newsroom of The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. It is a challenging time to assess the State of the Union. President Biden and his team viewed tonight's primetime address as an opportunity to highlight accomplishments and set a clear and optimistic agenda leading to the November midterms. But war in Ukraine has shifted the focus of tonight's speech and the nation. With me tonight, Rhonda Colvin on Capitol Hill, Joyce Coe outside the White House, Hannah Jewell reporting on the Republican response, and James Homan here in the Washington Post newsroom. Let's start with politics reporter Joyce Coe live outside the White House. Joyce, the world is watching President Biden tonight. What is at stake in this moment? All right, we'll go back to Joyce in just a moment. Picking us back up is Rhonda Colvin on Capitol Hill. Rhonda, you are at the center of the energy and the action. Uh, let's talk about first what is on the line tonight for President Biden, and then let's talk about what Capitol Hill is like in this moment. First off, what's in store for President Biden? Well, I think what's expected tonight for President Biden is that he's going to have to strike a balance, strike a balance to where he discusses his domestic agenda, the things that have passed, the successes his administration has had here on the Hill, while also looking forward to some of the things he wants the Hill to accomplish in the, in the short term. And of course, right now, Ukraine is the number one topic on the Hill. That's what's dominating the mood here today. I just recently spoke to two members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, David Cicilline and Sarah Jacobs. They were both in Ukraine back in January when there was a congressional delegation visiting with President Zelensky, and they said, no doubt, Ukraine needs to be a focus in this speech that we are waiting for in about an hour. And uh, Sarah Jacobs, she told me this is a domestic agenda. Uh, people may say, well, Biden needs to concentrate on some of these big issues like inflation, like gas prices. But to her, she said her constituents are asking her about the use of the military in this uh, region and, and what happens next. So that makes it a domestic issue. So members here, they want to hear more about the next steps on Ukraine. So we are expecting to hear that from the president. And in terms of just some local color here and, and the mood, it is quiet where I am. I'm, I'm with uh, most members of the media who are broadcasting live tonight. Uh, usually we are up uh, in Statuary Hall, which is, of course, near the House chamber uh, because of COVID, because of uh, security concerns. That is, is not a place for uh, media right now. So we're all kind of gathered here talking to members as they come by. Um, in terms of Ukraine, what you're probably going to see once we see the pictures from the chamber, uh, many members are wearing uh, ribbons and uh, handkerchiefs that are in the Ukrainian flag colors of blue and yellow. I've seen female uh, members of uh, the House dressed in blue and yellow uh, to show a sign of support. So you're probably going to see that when we do see those images out of the chamber. There's also security concerns here tonight. Of course, uh, outside, the Capitol is surrounded with uh, 
fencing that is temporary, the uh, chief of the Capitol Hill police is saying. It'll last for the next few days. It's also up because of anticipated demonstrations that might occur with the trucker convoy that was uh, in Canada. So uh, security is tight here, of course. The Capitol Police, as well as Metro Police, are surrounding this area. Uh, and no one is actually allowed in the Capitol uh, right now, other than those who are attending this speech and, and just a few members of the media. So that's sort of the mood here right now. You're also going to see, when you do see those images coming out of the chamber, you are going to see something we haven't seen in a while, which is uh, potentially members won't be wearing masks. Right now, uh, masks are optional on the House floor. That is a big shift. Over the last two years, masks have been required. Right now, uh, they are not. So that's something I'm sure that will be talked about once you start seeing who's wearing a mask, who's not wearing a mask. Uh, but that is one sign that things are somewhat returning to normal here on Capitol Hill. Rhonda Colvin, thank you so much. Well, as Rhonda laid out for us, Ukraine will be a major focus of President Biden's speech tonight. It's around 3 o'clock in the morning right now in Kiev. I want to bring in James Homan to update us on the latest Washington Post reporting on the fighting over the last 24 hours. James. Well, Libby, it was a, a day of regrouping for the Russian military. They fired several missiles at Kyiv. They aimed for the TV tower that uh, provides the, a lot of the media coverage to the capital city. They hit that, but they also hit a Holocaust memorial, killing five, lots of fiery images. Just north of Kyiv on this major road artery, there's a convoy that's 40 miles long, that's about 20 miles outside of Kyiv. As the sun is about to rise in Ukraine's capital, there is fear of a potential siege of this city that's something akin to what we've been seeing in recent days in the second biggest city of the country here, Kharkiv, a city of about one and a half million people. Now tonight, the mayor of Kharkiv telling the Washington Post that the city is surrounded by Russian troops, but that the Ukrainians are still in control of the city itself. A lot of the most intense fighting during the day Tuesday was in the southern part of the country. Crimea is here, which Russia annexed in 2014. Mariupol, which is a major city in the country, still controlled by the Ukrainian military. But we're expecting the Russians to move in from both the west and the east in the coming days. There was some very, very intense fighting in this area. The Russians took a city of about 150,000 people, and they continued to move eastward toward Mariupol. Uh, so the, this is a, a, a pretty intense clash right now. And as that fighting continues, this is increasingly becoming a humanitarian crisis, Libby, as well. The United Nations said this afternoon that 680,000 Ukrainians have now fled the country in the six days since Russia officially launched, launched its invasion. More than half of those people have exited into Poland, all of them going to the west. Obviously, they can't go east. Russia's here. Belarus, which is uh, obviously closely allied with Russia up here. So they're all moving through the west. This is becoming the biggest displacement of people in Europe since the Balkan Wars in the 90s. It's looking to be bigger than the Syrian refugee crisis in 2014 and 2015. And, uh, and, and these border checkpoints, these border crossings are quite hairy. Uh, following Poland, the second biggest influx is going into Hungary. Moldova and Romania are also getting refugees. There's a lot of pressure uh, on President Biden to grant temporary protected status to Ukrainians so that any Ukrainian in the United States doesn't have to go back to Ukraine. The White House expected to make an announcement on that very soon. James, take us through the latest international and American responses as, uh, as not just President Biden, but as Congress and as other uh, countries grapple with just what to do. So the, the U.S. government is about to ban Russian flights from entering domestic airspace following the lead of Canada and the Europeans. Uh, the big news on the response front today was a multilateral coalition announced that they're going to release 60 million barrels of oil from strategic petroleum reserves. 20 million of those barrels will come from the United States in order to blunt the surging price of gasoline. The company that controls Nord Stream 2, the pipeline uh, connecting Germany and Russia, uh, uh, today declared bankruptcy and is going insolvent because of sanctions. You're seeing more companies like Apple announced that they won't sell products in Russia anymore. And uh, this afternoon, Secretary of State Antony Blinken 
said that Russia is committing more war crimes by the hour and suggested that Russia be kicked out of the United Nations Human Rights Council. Thank you so much, James. Rhonda, let's go back to you uh, for some of the symbolism of tonight's speech. You know, uh, Ukraine's ambassador to the United States, Oksana Markarova, is going to be one of the First Lady's guests tonight. What is the, the symbolism and the meaning of this? Yeah, she'll be one of nine guests in the First Lady's uh, section, and, and that is something that is incredibly symbolic that shows you that uh, the president's administration wants to show uh, what they've been saying all along is that they are standing with Ukraine. So by having her here in the chamber, and you can expect likely that there will be applause if she's asked to stand, that's going to be visually a very significant uh, moment, a very poignant moment, and will show uh, sort of the direction and the mindset right now of the Biden administration as they take on this crisis. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, Ukraine is certainly a centerpiece right now in the discussion on the Hill. Uh, there is uh, discussion right now about a potential aid package, a $10 billion aid package package that the uh, Senate may be considering soon that would help with uh, efforts in Ukraine. Uh, they're also directing their attention to the humanitarian issues right now. James just uh, mentioned the temporary protected status. That is something that I know uh, members of the Ukrainian Congressional Caucus are pushing for right now to make sure anyone leaving Ukraine is protected. So again, by having that ambassador here uh, during this uh, speech that is usually reserved for a president to discuss his his domestic agenda, that's going to be a really important moment to watch for. Politics reporter Joyce Coe live outside the White House. Joyce, tell us more about how President Biden is approaching tonight's high profile speech. Well, Libby, earlier drafts of this State of the Union speech looked much different just weeks ago uh, than it will tonight when President Biden delivers his first State of the Union address. Uh, we expect that he will be talking about not just domestic issues, but of course, what is happening abroad in Ukraine. You know, usually this is a speech that is given to a domestic audience, uh, just the people in our country. But tonight, it will really have um, eyes globally uh, as world leaders and people around the world are, are looking to President Biden to see how he leads in this moment. We did receive some excerpts from the White House of what he will be saying tonight in part. Uh, and I wanted to read some of these to you. He's going to be tonight urging Congress to fight inflation, really trying to tie in the messaging uh, on Ukraine to underscore American priorities. So on the economy, he's going to urge Congress to, quote, lower your cost, not your wages, uh, really touching on this $15 an hour uh, federal minimum wage that he wants Congress to pass. He's also going to say, uh, quote, make more cars and semiconductors in America, more infrastructure and innovation in America as he touts his infrastructure bill, that bipartisan bill that he signed into law back in November. And he also, uh, there is a part of this excerpt that says, uh, quote, more jobs where you can earn a good living in America. Instead of relying on foreign, su foreign supply chains, let's make it in America. So this is really President Biden talking uh, about and addressing what is happening in Ukraine, uh, both in terms of establishing uh, a democracy there and um, supporting the democracy, I should say, but also really talking about the economy and how this could potentially influence Americans um, here at home and, and really urging Congress to act on uh, these issues uh, to bolster the U.S. economy uh, and, and make things here in America. This is a sentiment that we've heard him uh, talk about over the course of uh, his presidency in this first year. So that's a bit of what we can expect to hear from President Biden's speech tonight. Libby. Thank you so much. Let's go now to national video reporter Hannah Jewell to talk about how Republicans are approaching the State of the Union. You know, Hannah, tonight is the president's, but it's also one to watch the reactions in that House chamber to get a sense of national unity or in many cases division. So what will you be watching for? Well, as Rhonda just mentioned, Libby, the masks are going to be a really interesting visual um, symbol of the division in this country. Um, as she mentioned earlier, you know, it's no longer required 
to wear masks in the House. Um, I imagine that we're going to see perhaps a stark divide between Republicans and Democrats in the House chamber, um, showing that politicization and that division um, around public health that we have witnessed over the last two years. But beyond that, Libby, uh, the State of the Union provides such a fascinating uh, time to see where everyone stands on certain issues by what they do with their bodies. Do they stand? Do they clap? Do they resolutely sit down with their arms folded, sort of, you know, scowling? This is a moment for every member of Congress to really show um, and express their pleasure or displeasure. And I'm particularly interested in seeing how Republicans react to Biden's uh, expected comments about Ukraine. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, division and, indeed, some pivots in Republican talking points about Ukraine and about Putin's invasion of this country um, over the last week, even, as the uh, invasion has gotten worse. So I'll be interested to see what they are willing to stand and clap for and what they aren't. Um, and even if we do see moments of unity uh, in which, you know, everybody in the chamber is standing up to applaud uh, Biden's expected praise for President Zelensky of Ukraine, Ukrainian resistance fighters. Uh, there certainly will not be that kind of unity around uh, Republican reactions to how they think, you know, Biden is handling this crisis. Mm, you know, the past week has certainly shifted what the president plans to say. Tell us more about how it's shifting the Republicans' approach as well, Hannah. Well, as I said, there's been this kind of fascinating thing to watch in real time over the last week. We had uh, President, former President Trump last week uh, calling Putin a genius, saying that he was really smart for getting away with this at that time uh, with only what Trump characterized as some minor sanctions. Uh, that's not how, of course, the president would characterize it. Um, so you really saw that starting point. You had, you know, Fox News hosts, uh, Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram, uh, talking, even sort of making fun of President Zelensky, uh, Ingram basically called it a pathetic display, uh, his speech where he was begging Putin not to invade. You saw, you had that line, you had Trump saying this, and then as the invasion got worse, you saw sort of a pivot, you saw more Republicans, sort of Congress people, leaders, and indeed Tucker Carlson himself, uh, Trump himself, sort of beginning to more resolutely more clearly condemn Putin, um, though other, you know, Republican members of Congress not necessarily willing to also criticize Trump's prior comments on this. But you saw this shift happening as the, you know, the Republican Party was sort of trying to find its line on this. You had CPAC last weekend, where you had um, applause for, you know, support for Ukraine. Um, and what you've seen start to emerge is the way that uh, Republicans are trying to sort of shape their critiques of Biden around foreign policy. You know, they came into this um, this night ready to critique Biden's domestic agenda, but even as Biden is beginning to pivot, so too the Republicans and their criticism are going to try and sort of blame this crisis on him. You know, we saw a moment ago, Hannah, that fencing that's up around the Capitol, and it was put up, in the words of the U.S. Capitol Police chief, to prevent any disruption to the work of Congress. And conservative activists had planned protests around Washington against COVID restrictions this week. Tell us more about how Republicans are responding to this. Well, you, you've seen that fencing um, that was put up with D.C. not wanting to see another January 6th. And you see these precautions over what had planned to be a rally on the mall today, which actually turned out to be kind of a bust. There was this big stage set up um, for a sort of freedom rally that, that didn't happen. You've seen also uh, there's meant to be a trucker convoy that is still on its way, um, inspired by those in Canada. Right now, they're around Indiana. They're meant to get here Friday or Saturday. It's very unclear if what they plan to do once they get here. Um, and they've also actually, the planners of that convoy have kind of been complaining in their chat rooms, as our, our reporting has uh, talked about, that Ukraine is distracting from their cause. And their cause is COVID restrictions, anti-COVID restrictions, anti-vaccine mandates, masks, and so on. You can see them um, trying to push back against that, but also having the wind sort of taken out of their sails by war in Europe. All right. Thanks so much, Hannah Jewell. We'll be checking in with you a little later on about the Republican uh, response, which will be delivered tonight after President Biden, and that will be delivered by the governor of Iowa. Let's go now to White House reporter Cleve Woodson. Uh, Cleve, you've been tracking how President Biden's supporters are feeling about his job performance, feeling about the state of the nation. What does he need to do tonight to excite and satisfy those supporters? Yeah, uh, good to see you, Libby. You know, one of the questions I think is what what can Biden do? You know, I talked to a lot of supporters who who said that, you know, they see what Biden's doing on the pandemic, on vaccines, even, you know, his recent actions on Ukraine, 
but when they talk to their Republican friends or even their moderate friends that it's not sort of breaking through, right? And you, you've seen Biden talk about this sometimes, too, how he says, you know, these are the actions that we're doing, but, you know, people aren't hearing it or understanding it, and he, he needs to make that that case better. And so what I, th I think we'll see is Biden sort of taking, making the case directly to the American people. This is what I'm doing. This is what I have done. This is what I want to do in the future. You know, the question, though, is that, you know, with a president who has an approval rating of 37 percent, with, with people having doubts about Democrats in Congress, like, will that even permeate through, you know, to all of these people who have, you know, either negative or lukewarm opinions about the president already? Let's dig more into some of those approval ratings with James Homan. Uh, he is looking at the latest poll numbers from a Washington Post ABC News poll. James, tell us more. Yeah, as Cleve mentioned, the president's approval rating, 37 percent. 55 percent of the country disapproves of Biden. These numbers are remarkably similar to where Donald Trump was one year into his presidency. Uh, and it, it is not a good trend line for President Biden. You can see he came into office in the mid-50s. And he has fallen in every single Washington Post ABC poll. He's now down at his all time low. That's why this speech is so important, Libby. This is the biggest audience that Biden is going to get of the year. And when you talk to folks at the White House, you'll notice going back to the, the trend line, one of the reasons it really fell last summer was because of what happened in Afghanistan. And now we can look at what impact that had, which is perceptions of Biden as a strong leader. Those took a huge hit. They have not recovered. Now, you'd expect during an international crisis there would be some kind of rally around the flag effect, that people would kind of support the president. The problem for the White House is that only 36 percent, about the same as think that he uh, is, is a, doing a good job, think that he's strong as a leader, much worse, two-thirds of independents don't think that the president is a strong leader. But the next question from our poll that we released over the weekend is even more troubling for the Biden administration. Does Joe Biden have the mental sharpness to be president? 54% of Americans say no. 59% of independents say no. We asked this question in a poll in May 2020, and the numbers were reversed. A majority of Americans thought Biden did have the mental sharpness. One of the tests for the president tonight, he's talking for an hour Will he convey that he is a man in charge uh, with his hands on the steering wheel? The White House sees this as one of the, the numbers they really want to move. Thank you so much, James. Cleve, let's go back to you for, for that sinking approval number that we saw from James, that arc. When you talk to voters, how much were they thinking about foreign policy versus their own personal experiences of the pandemic and the last year plus of their lives? Yeah, it's actually a mix of most, of, of, of both, right? Because we talked to these voters over the past week as the biggest headline was what was happening in Ukraine and, and whether Biden was a competent leader, whether his foreign policy bona fides were good enough to get us through. But, you know, one, one important thing to realize that, it, that the things at the top of the Washington Post or on CNN or, or wherever, you know, are, don't necessarily always reflect what an individual voter is thinking about his or her individual lives. People are still enduring the after effects or the effects of the pandemic. They're still dealing with uh, inflation. We are hyper attuned to what's going to happen. You know, many of us have made popcorn and we're prepared to, to watch this speech end to end. Most people are kind of living and enduring their own lives. And what that means is that, you know, what President Biden does or says tonight may not have an immediate effect as much as it goes into people's general perception of how the president is, how he's how he's behaving, what he's good at, what he's what he's not good at. But so it's it's just a mix. People, you know, what's happening in Ukraine at the forefront of a lot of people's minds, but so is how much gas costs, so is how much, you know, stuff costs at the groceries, whether their children have to wear masks to school. All of that stuff factors in. You know, Cleve, one of the challenges of this speech is it has to be delivered, any State of the Union, any big speech like this, has to be delivered with a lot of confidence, you know, hitting the right lines in the right moment, knowing when people are going to applaud. This has been a speech in motion. So how challenging is it that it's been going through rewrites and revamps and, you know, it, it hasn't had that time to, to really sort of get crafted and age in the president's mind and mouth over this past week or so? 
Yeah, you, I mean, I, I think you hit it exactly on the he head. The, the speech as envisioned by the earliest speech writers two weeks ago might be vastly different. And in fact, we have some, some of my colleagues on the White House team have some reporting that it was being crafted over and over and over again. Now, I, I think the White House hopes that, you know, th those rewrites will appeal more to Biden's strengths, right? Like uh, improvement on the pandemic front, uh, you know, Americans behind the the sanctions or punishing uh, uh, Putin over its invasion of Ukraine but you know for a speech that has to do a lot and 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 you also have to think about this speech as setting the tone for the next eight months you know most moderates are independents, according to our poll, don't really approve of the job that Democrats are doing. So what Biden is trying to say to the American people and, and to his party is, look, th we are doing a good job, and this is why you should, you know, not, continue, not only continue to support us, but also, you know, think about keeping us in power in November, eight months from now. All right, thanks, Cleve. Let's bring Joyce Coe back in. She's outside the White House. Uh, Joyce, talk about Biden's first year in office and some of the key moments that his, that his administration ha have had to deal with, some of the highlights that have led to tonight's address. Yeah, you know, Libby, President Biden has you know, ran on this message of unity. He has infused unity into a number of his key speeches over the course of this last year. But tonight he will be speaking to, uh, by many indications, a divided nation, a nation that's divided on things like the pandemic, the politics surrounding the pandemic, on social issues like race relations. Uh, and his immediate audience, Congress, uh, is reflective of this. Republicans and Democrats and even members of his own party uh, and the infighting there uh, that has divided uh, really the, the split in Congress where they weren't able to get key agenda items um, of Biden's administration passed just a couple months ago. So looking back at the Biden administration and really where things started, Biden's inauguration back in January of 2021 was really this triumphant feat for democracy. Uh, it happened just two weeks after the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol. And then he had a pretty huge legislative accomplishment shortly after that with the American Rescue Plan, which was that $1.9 trillion coronavirus relief package uh, that he signed into law uh, to really boost the economy and help families that were struggling following the coronavirus. Uh, and then he saw poll numbers and his approval ratings slip during the summer when he responded to uh, the troop withdrawal in Afghanistan and sort of the way that he went about that. His administration had uh, stood by the way that he pulled troops out of Afghanistan um, and the airlift of more than 100,000 people, but ultimately 13 U.S. service members ended up getting killed in that operation. Uh, and so he has really struggled to come back from those uh, approval numbers since the summer. We saw he had some more legislative accomplishments with um, with the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill that he signed into law back in November. But after that, uh, he he and Democrats really failed to pass two other agenda items, the Build Back Better plan and uh, anything on a federal voting rights act. So Biden is really coming into this State of the Union speech with an, a long list of agenda items. Uh, we got some excerpts from the White House earlier today, as well as uh, some fact sheets, where they laid out a number of things that Biden will be talking about. Uh, first and foremost, on economic policy, he will be urging Congress to um, to do things like hi to heighten the um, raise, I should say, the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. He wants to lower the cost of uh, a number of things for working families, like prescription drug prices and um, housing costs. So he'll be urging Congress, and we will hear him talk a lot about the economy. Uh, and of course, President Biden, just within the last week, nominated um, a Supreme Court nominee uh, to succeed Justice Stephen Breyer. Uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, and we will be hearing him sort of make that push to Congress to confirm her as a justice to the Supreme Court. She would be the first black woman to ever be uh, confirmed to the Supreme Court uh, if 
if that happens. Yeah, so and, uh, a couple that will of be, big that will be important uh, to see because we'll see some of those Supreme Court justices tonight in the chamber, and the president certainly hopes that a year from now, at his next State of the Union, he sees a Justice Jackson there as well. Thank you so much, Joyce. I want to pivot to James Homan to pick up where Joyce left off there on the economy a few moments ago, James, because uh, there's a real question of just what President Biden can do for the economy, frankly. But but maybe the bigger question is even how can he convince Americans that the economy isn't as bad as they think it is? Well, that, that's a, a quite a needle to thread. And to understand it, let's look at the Washington Post ABC poll that came out over the weekend. When you add together, you know, you ask people, how do you think the nation's economy is doing? A total of 75 percent say either not so good or poor. That was 70 percent uh, just three months ago. So that number continues to increase. Only about one in four Americans think that the economy is in good shape. Just 3% think it's excellent. And the reason those numbers are so bad is because when it comes to economics, people think about themselves. How am I being affected? And we asked in our poll, are you better off financially than when Biden became president? Half of people say I'm about the same shape. 35% say not as well off. 17% say better off. This is a, a, a big red flag number for the administration. And the reason that it's so frustrating for the Biden White House is that wages have gone up, unemployment's around 4%, but inflation's at a 40-year high. As one Biden advisor put it to me, when people's paychecks go up, they think they earned it. When the prices go up, they think it's a tax on them. And inflation is a huge problem. So Biden needs to sound like he gets it, like he feels the pain of people who are paying higher prices, especially poorer Americans. The challenge is, right now, only 37 percent, the same as approve of his overall job, approve of how Biden is doing on the economy. The other question we asked is, which party do you think is better? Republicans have a 19-point edge over Democrats on the economy. That is the biggest advantage that Republicans have had on this question in a post-poll since 1990. So we're going to hear a lot about Ukraine. We're going to hear about what's happening in Europe. That's going to get the most attention tonight. Ultimately, though, the midterm elections are going to come down a lot more to how people feel the economy is doing and which party they think can handle it better. And in that vein, let's look at this, this question. The poll essentially asked who's to blame for inflation, for rising prices. Half of people say Biden deserves a great deal of blame. And the... the uh, Biden, as he leaves the White House there to head over to Capitol Hill, uh, is, is going to try to basically say that it's not his fault. He has four different sections in tonight's speech that are focused on the economy and specifically trying to tie in some of his economic proposals to uh, his effort to lower prices. And people are pretty amenable to it. Three quarters of Americans say that uh, disruptions from COVID deserve a lot of blame for prices going up, for supply chain problems. 70% or 68% say corporations trying to increase their profits deserve blame. Biden's going to highlight not those numbers, but both of those dynamics. He's going to say that we need to bring supply chains to the United States, that we need to make things here domestically. Uh, and he's going to call out meat. Uh, processors and uh, monopolies generally say businesses are taking advantage of, of consumers. All of that is part of an effort, Libby, to show that he understands the pain that people are feeling in the economy, but that it's not his fault. That's a hard message to deliver when you're the president, though. Thank you so much, James Homan. And as we watch that motorcade process down Pennsylvania Avenue, you can also see there the Senate chamber. Senators are preparing to go themselves across the Capitol over to the House chamber to experience and witness tonight's State of the Union address. It is President Biden's first official State of the Union address. The address he gave to a joint session of Congress about a year ago uh, was not this official State of the Union. And you can see there. The masks are off uh, members of the Senate as they head over. Uh, the rules have changed, and so they are allowed to go maskless uh, through the chamber and over to the House this evening. Uh, Cleve, I, I want to bring you in for two things. One, Cleve, as we hear James reflect on those numbers, you know, the White House has to come up with their strategy of how they talk to Americans about the responsible parties for the economy, uh, but also try to give them some faith and confidence that President Biden can lead the way. Uh, yeah, 100 percent, right? Like, if, if Biden were to just shift the blame and say, this is, this is 
you know, the corporations' fault or this is, you, you know, Russia's fault, then it makes it really, really difficult for, for people who are asking, well, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing to lead? And so one of the things that we'll see Biden try to do is in very plain spoken ways, you know, say, you know, this is our way out of this. Like, this is how we chart, uh, we chart a path out of this, while also sort of not taking too much, too much of the blame sort of onto himself. And as James, you know, eloquently put, that is a really, really tough needle to thread. And my final question for you, Cleve, is what are you going to be listening for and watching for tonight? It's always so insightful to hear what our reporters who've been out talking to voters and hearing about their concerns bring to viewing tonight's speech. What, what should we listen for? I wonder what Biden says to folks that um, maybe we're not the hardest core Democrats or the, the, the biggest Biden supporters, folks who maybe maybe they voted against Trump or maybe they were just, you know, they, they, they believed in Biden, but not not, you know, 100 percent. I wonder what his argument is to those. A lot of times we know what the right believes and what the left believes. But, you know, in the middle, like in the margins on the middle, like those folks who need a reason to go to the polls, who need a reason to continue to trust. Like, that that's, I think, what Biden is going to, to hit on. I, I also wonder, you know, what specifically he says about the middle class, about the economy, you know, for folks like my, my parents who are worried about the, the rising cost um, of everything. That's a, a pocketbook issue that affects every single thing some people in America do. And, it's, and so I wonder what argument he makes for those people about why they should keep putting trust in him. Thank you so much, Cleve Woodson, White House reporter. Rhonda Colvin, let's go to you on Capitol Hill. We're watching the senators uh, go through Statuary Hall on their way over to the House chamber. It's a place that you and I are usually stationed watching, and it is usually full of people just jam-packed elbow to elbow witnessing this moment. Uh, talk to us about what you're watching for tonight. That's true. You know, in years before the pandemic, we would have been crammed in that room trying to talk to senators and, and lawmakers as they go by. Uh, and that has not been so now for the second year in a row. I think what I'll be watching for tonight is listening to how the president addresses his Build Back Better agenda. You'll remember that that was the uh, infrastructure, the social infrastructure package that involved climate initiatives. It involved more money for uh, programs for children, it, it, a lot of social spending in there. And it was an ambitious plan. However, it did fizzle out back in December when the two uh, key swing votes in the Senate said they would not support it. So it's, it seems like it's been on pause a little bit here on Capitol Hill. I suspect he will want to bring it up somehow. So how does he recast it? How does he discuss it? What is his pitch to these lawmakers and his pitch to the American people that he can get something like that done? Because it did involve a lot of those kitchen table issues that a lot of Americans are wondering about right now. So I'm, I'm wondering how he addresses that. Um, if Ukraine did not happen or if some of these other things that uh, over the last few months didn't happen, I, I suspect Biden would have been on the road in the last few weeks discussing this more. And he has been. His wife has also been visiting a uh, community college discussing that uh, social infrastructure plan. But it's fizzled out here a little bit on Capitol Hill. So uh, I'd like to see how he's going to address that again. What's his plan forward? Is it going to break it up? That's been one of the theories here on Capitol Hill is that that plan is going to be broken up so that it can be voted on issue by issue instead of one large plan. So I'll be listening to see how he uh, talks about Build Back Better. Rhonda, we just saw the Vice President Kamala Harris enter the House chamber. The senators are coming in now, and so Speaker Pelosi has called the House to order. Rhonda, I just have to remark what a, what a striking visual this is, to see the masks off, to see the Vice President without a mask, and to see uh, so many people coming in here. It, you know, it won't be as crowded as it would have been three or four years ago, but it will still be a full chamber, Rhonda. That's right. Just, you know, last year, I believe it was around 200 people were allowed into the chamber and people had to uh, bring virtual guests. And then that's a practice that they're actually still doing this year. A number of people have virtual guests that might be around to stay for uh, years to come. But you're right. Uh, you're not seeing many masks. I think I see Jerry Nadler there uh, from the House. He's wearing a mask. 
Uh, but, I, you know, you're not seeing many lawmakers do so. They're also speaking very closely to each other. It looks very uh, 2019 <laughs> and earlier. Uh, and this is certainly a shift for the House. The House, um, and not the Senate, but the House did have uh, regulations for the last uh, couple years that members had to be masked. In fact, if you weren't masked, you were fined. Uh, so for this to be a change that we're seeing on this night, it's really interesting visually. And it's also going to be interesting when President Biden walks through. Uh, he knows many of these people personally as having served in uh, Congress for such a long time. He'll likely want to shake hands, hug, you know, and uh, speak closely. Uh, so it's really going to be interesting to see what type of balance he strikes um, because he Again, his administration will want to convey to people that, yes, this pandemic is still here with us, but we are learning to deal with it. Um, and, and it's just, it's really going to be truly interesting to see how he comes in. And we're seeing the media there as they, as they watch, and that would normally be packed with reporters uh, watching what's happening. Um, so there, there are still some differences. We are still seeing uh, a much thinner press corps in attendance uh, tonight at this State of the Union. Uh, James, something else we're seeing, a lot of members of the Senate and House wearing yellow and blue, the colors of Ukraine, James. We're also seeing uh, people with Ukrainian flags. Uh, we just saw Mitt Romney and Joe Manchin coming in together, uh, Manchin holding a Ukrainian placard, and uh, Romney appeared to have a lapel that had an American and Ukrainian flag. Uh, you see some you know, pops of yellow and pops of blue there uh, on the floor, and that is, uh, and it's on both sides of the aisle. It's Democrats and Republicans. Uh, it, 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 Rhonda said it feels like 2019. It does feel sort of normal. And I'll tell you that that's part of the strategy for this speech by the White House. They originally had intended this to be part of the kind of pivot, a return to normalcy, uh, to pre-COVID, to kind of recognizing where the rest of the country is. And, uh, and it, it will be just a lot louder in there than it was a year ago when the audience was so much smaller. And, and at some points it kind of sounded like Biden was echoing in that big cavernous chamber. Let's bring in The Washington Post chief correspondent, Dan Baltz. Dan, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Uh, where does this speech come uh, in terms of Joe Biden's presidency? How pivotal is this moment? What is the opportunity that he has? And also, what is the lift? Well, the opportunity that he has, obviously, is to begin something of a reset for his presidency, given his low approval ratings and the, the, the warning signs that Democrats see heading into the November elections. But um, this is a speech that's going to be given in a much, much different context than they had imagined when they started writing this speech. I mean, the, what has happened over the last week and, and prior to that in the run-up, but in the last week with the Russian invasion of Ukraine has completely transformed this moment. Um, and he now has two important audiences. He has an important audience at home, uh, which right now does not see him as a strong leader, uh, does not approve of much of what he is doing as president, um, but he also has an international audience that is going to be looking at him to, in essence, define what is probably the beginning of a new era in international security policy. Um, and so the question is, how does he balance those um, challenges? Um, he has to deal with the domestic issues that are foremost in the minds of the voters, uh, but he also has to explain to Americans and to the rest of the world why this moment is so important and what it is going to take in the long run uh, to deal with a, you know, a Vladimir Putin uh, who is bent on in one way or another trying to recreate a Soviet or a Russian empire. Dan, how much are the messages uh, uh, weaving together? You know, how much does President Biden talk about this this existential threat that Russia poses in, in terms of the, the, the trying to save democracy in Europe. And how much does he tie that into his goals domestically? Is there, is there a danger there? Are they trying to separate those two things or bring them together? Well, I think that's one of the challenges of the speech. And I'm, I, like everybody else, I'm, I'm interested to see how they do that. We know that the theme of democracy versus authoritarianism has been a longstanding theme of President Biden since he came into office. Um, and in some ways, this has been more of a kind of a domestic discussion, uh, in part because of the challenges to our own democracy here at home. 
home, uh, we're now seeing the international implications in a much more existential way. Uh, and so I think that gives him the opportunity to talk about that uh, and to bring it home in a way that he might not have been able to do it before. It's not a theoretical discussion anymore. It's a real live discussion uh, as these Russian uh, troops are, are bombarding the cities of Ukraine. Um, but the question is, um, we know that the sanctions that have been imposed uh, are not only going to, you know, bring tremendous costs to the Russian economy and the Russian people and Russian oligarchs, it's going to have an impact here at home and in a country that's already feeling the effects of rising gas prices and rising grocery prices and higher car prices and all kinds of things, um, that's likely to get worse. And he's going to have to try to explain um, what he is going to do to try to mitigate that. He can't solve that problem, um, in part because the policies that he and our European allies have, have begun to implement um, are going to cause those things to, to be worse. So he's going to have to try to, to do a kind of a delicate balancing act in, in explaining why this is worth it why the United States has to lead in a moment like this um, and some of the sacrifices that, that may be born at home. But that's not a message that's necessarily going to be well received here in the United States. We're watching the guests of the First Lady of the United States come into that top chamber there among her guests the Ukrainian ambassador to the United States, a symbolic addition to the guest list. Uh, other guests of the First Lady tonight include Frances Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower. Uh, we'll also see the chief executive of Intel. We'll see a nurse who's been treating COVID patients. Also, a steel worker and a seventh grader locally here from Virginia. Joshua Davis is a diabetes advocate and a middle school student. That's just some of who we will see joining the First Lady tonight. You know, Dan, we were talking a little while ago about the Build Back Better agenda and, you know, just the... the the, the, the counter efforts that that man right there, Joe Manchin, did uh, to sort of bring his party to its heels as it tried to pass its uh, domestic agenda. You know, we've been wondering if we'd hear the words build back better tonight. Uh, we'll hear components of that legislation that the president and his team think they can still get through. Uh, how significant is it, though, that it's been so pared back? Well, it's very significant, obviously. I mean, it's the third pillar of his domestic agenda that began with the uh, the American Rescue Plan and then the bipartisan infrastructure bill. But but in many ways, to many people in the Democratic Party, and particularly the activist wing of the party, the Build Back Better uh, bill was really what the uh, kind of be all and end all for what they were looking for because it it was an effort to finally do some of the things that they have wanted to do in terms of expanding uh, domestic uh, programs and domestic safety net programs and also dealing with the uh, the threat of climate change so the fact that that has been you know if if not scuttled certainly put way on the back burner uh, has been a blow to his uh, presidency and, and to many people in the Democratic Party. And the question is, to what extent are they able to resurrect pieces of it? Uh, and how are they going to be able to do that? And uh, I think tonight he's going to have to begin to say, here's what we would like to do. And here may be some of the priorities. Uh, I, I don't know how deeply he will go into that. Um, that, you know, that's a little bit of sausage making, frankly, that, you know, for a, a big domestic audience isn't necessarily going to, um, you know, resonate that much. But uh, he has to, he has to talk about what he wants to do on the domestic front. Uh, my guess is, and again, based on the, the limited excerpts that we've seen of the speech, he's going to try to put a lot of this in the context of dealing with inflation, that the things he is doing um, are, are aimed at lowering prices, at, at easing the pain that people are feeling at the pump or, or at the grocery store, um, and that some of the things that he wants to do uh, that were in the Build Back Better bill uh, would go some ways to beginning to do that. Um, but, uh, but again, uh, he's in a different place on that than he was. James, uh, let's talk about elements that uh, will survive from Build Back Better and priorities of uh, the, the Biden administration, things that they still hope they can resurrect from that, or uh, points they believe can find bipartisan support, or even if not Republicans in terms of these bodies right here, uh, independent voters across the country. What's on President Biden's agenda? 
President Biden is going to call for what he says is a unity agenda, that he thinks that there are these elements of his social spending plan that can get bipartisan support, and he's going to present getting something done, putting points on the board as a way to show autocracies in the world uh, that the United States can get its act together and can still pass uh, major pieces of legislation. Interestingly, you know, I don't expect that we'll hear the term build back better out of the president's mouth tonight. Uh, in the early drafts of the speech, one of the things that Biden was going to emphasize was climate change. He's still going to mention climate change. Polls show that to liberal base voters, that remains their single most important issue. But the Ukraine crisis does change the dynamic a little bit. All of a sudden, gas prices up more than a dollar from where they were a year ago. Oil prices uh, over $100 a barrel. It makes it hard to talk about reducing fuel consumption and that kind of thing. So he's going to have to be careful about how he talks about climate change, uh, even though that it was a huge part of Build Back Better. We're hearing Speaker Pelosi call the chamber to order. Okay, then we do these, okay? The joint session will come to order. The chair appoints as members of the committee on the part of the House to escort the President of the United States into the chambers. As Speaker Pelosi gets prepared for Maryland President Biden to, to come into the chamber, the uh, let's go to Rhonda Colvin to talk about the optics of tonight. Rhonda, you know, it is so significant, and we can't forget about this, to see two women flanking the President of the United States, the Vice President, a female Speaker of the House. Uh, what will you be watching tonight in terms of, in terms of reactions to the speech, in terms of uh, the volume, the support, or perhaps the silence of members in this chamber? Yeah, th these are always important moments to sort of read the room. And I think I'll be listening out. Since Ukraine seems to have brought some sense of unity uh, among Democrats and Republicans here on the Hill, you know, they're all, uh, both sides of the aisle are wearing the ribbons uh, with the Ukrainian flag colors uh, or they're dressed in the colors. I'm wondering how they will respond when he specifically talks about uh, the Ukraine issue. Are you going to hear uh, applause or, or any sort of audible support on that issue? Um, I think I'm also going, if he mentions uh, his Supreme Court nominee, uh, who has uh, started the process of touring the Hill soon, uh, how people are going to react to that. Uh, that's one of the, the things we'll be watching for soon, that confirmation hearing process. Um, there is just so much to watch when you are, are looking at both the verbal and also the, the things that aren't said in the room. You know, what, what are the faces like of some of the Republican uh, leaders in the Senate? What do they look like when he brings up some of those pieces of his uh, agenda up that they have said that they don't support? Uh, this is a moment where the Democrats as well, especially in the House, since we've seen so many decide not to run for re-election, they're going to need him to sort of uh, rally the troops here because we're in primary season. In fact, tonight is uh, the Texas primary. Uh, we're heading into the midterm, so the Democrats are going to need him to also rally for them. That's, that's another purpose of this speech. Anna Jewell to talk about the Republican response, which will be delivered after President Biden speaks. Tonight's response will come from Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds. Hannah, tell us more. So Kim Reynolds has been the Republican governor of Iowa since 2017, uh, where she is very popular in that state, though only among uh, Republicans. She's a more sort of polarizing figure than other sort of state-level Republicans um, in that state. And she was picked because she sort of um, is a representative of the kind of, you know, governor, the kind of Republican leadership that Republicans want to project going into the midterms at the end of this year, um, particularly in her handling of COVID. Um, and uh, she opposed vaccine mandates. She opposed mask mandates. She kept schools open for most of the pandemic. Um, and she's someone who uh, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy has said 
uh, quote, she kept kids in school and critical race theory out. So you see there how she's really um, projecting these really important issues to Republicans. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how she responds, you know, as a governor of a, of a state uh, to a speech that's going to drive so heavily, be driven by foreign policy aspects. Um, we can expect her to praise the Ukrainian resistance to Russia's invasion, but also to cast blame for it on Biden, referencing, for example, um, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. We just saw the diplomatic corps uh, welcomed into the chamber. Uh, James, uh, the members of the cabinet are here, but there is a designated survivor, as there is every year. What does your reporting tell you? Who is left behind tonight? A person familiar says that the person left behind tonight is Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. The former governor of Rhode Island, a sort of a rising star from the moderate wing of the Democratic Party, someone who potentially has presidential ambitions, someone who's considered as part of the Veep stakes. And uh, let's talk about uh, a questionable item on tonight's agenda, uh, banning members of Congress from trading stocks. We wondered if it would make it into the speech. What are we, what are we watching for and listening for, James? Well, a member of Congress told me that, it, that he... Uh, that it has been part of drafts, it, uh, that, that it has been included in, in some drafts. It's uh, an open question of whether it's going to survive, whether they'll take that out. Uh, it's obviously not super popular with some members to ban uh, lawmakers from trading stocks. Uh, Nancy Pelosi several months ago said that this is a capitalist society and members should have skin in the game. And polls show overwhelming majorities of Americans want to stop lawmakers from trading stocks. This could become a really potent political issue for Republicans in the midterm elections. And so you could see the president make this announcement. But if he does, it's, it's one of those wild announcements to make to endorse this kind of legislation before all these members of Congress. And it would be quite fascinating to see how people would respond this is one of those things that may get cut uh, and left on the cutting room floor. Dan Baltz, uh, let's bring you in on uh, on just how important the State of the Union address is in, in, in this modern moment, in this modern era, when, you know, short clips, short videos really are the things that sort of, you know, ping across the web and ping across our consciousness. How significant or important is this long, hour-long speech that a president gives once a year? Libby, I think over the years the the significance of it has uh, gone downhill. I, I don't think it carries quite the weight that it once did. Um, audiences are not as big as they used to be, and as you suggest, people get their news in different ways, and they get it in snippets, and they get it on their phone, and uh, they're not necessarily tuning in for the full hour of the speech. And so um, that that's in a sense the kind of the political reality of it, and yet we know that each year uh, there's a tremendous amount of work invested in this speech. There's serious debates within the administration, any, any administration, about what goes in and what doesn't get in to the speech. Um, there's, there's careful thought to the stagecraft of the speech. Um, and, and so a, a tremendous amount of uh, intense work surrounds this moment. And it's, it's the kind of thing where no president can take it lightly. Uh, no administration can afford to kind of wing it at the State of the Union. And, and as I said earlier, um, we are in a particular moment. I mean, it is, it is unusual for a State of the Union to coincide with this kind of foreign policy crisis. And so I think that gives it heightened attention. Um, but whether what he says is long-lasting, I, 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 I'm a little bit skeptical. I think that whatever message he has tonight is one that he's going to have to continue to deliver to the American people and, frankly, to the rest of the world. Well, we are glad that you, our audience, are watching us tonight here with The Washington Post. We will bring you the speech, of course, in its entirety. We'll have the Republican rebuttal afterwards, and then we'll have analysis from our Washington Post colleagues. Uh, it, it, Dan Boltz, you know, this State of the Union address can be a kickoff for what comes next, right? The president typically goes on the road to sell the ideas. And, you know, as we look at just how much money might be spent on certain priorities, we won't get necessarily bottom lines tonight. We might get some, but a lot of those bottom lines will come later as the budget is crafted. I, I just want to point out, of course, the First Lady of the United States, Jill Biden, and the second gentleman, Doug Imhoff, coming in there. Uh, I'll go back to you in a moment, Dan, but as we watch for a moment the First Lady greeting the Ukrainian ambassador to the United States.
and you see there the other guests of the First Lady. We saw members of the Supreme Court come in a moment ago, the Chief Justice, as well as four other justices, including Justice Breyer, in what we expect to be his final appearance here, as he has announced his retirement pending the confirmation of his successor. So, Dan, this kicks off going on the road and getting some hard numbers about, about the budget and what the president really wants to see. Madam yeah, Speaker, and, I mean, every, every president in, in recent memory goes on the road right after the State of the Union message. They, they, the State of the Union is a big moment. Uh, they want to try to build on whatever momentum they get out of the speech, whatever good reaction they get out of the speech, um, and they want to go out into the country um, and begin to have that ripple beyond the, you know, the, the beltway and the borders of, of uh, Washington. Um, but, um, you know, this is a president who has an enormous amount of stuff on his plate uh, and how much he will be able to juggle all of that. I mean, he had said, um, you know, a month or so ago that he intended to get out of Washington more in his second year than he was able to do in the first year. And now he suddenly has this enormous foreign policy crisis um, that is consuming a, a considerable amount of his time just in the, the amount of diplomatic work that he is doing and, and others in his administration are doing behind the scenes. So um, he, he's, he's going to be limited in how much he's going to be able to get out. Um, and I think that people are going to ultimately make their judgments on how they feel about their own lives, their own economies, their own finances, um, and how well he's dealing with the, you know, the big challenges both here and abroad. Rhonda, we've watched the cabinet come in, and of course, some of the people we are watching closely, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, uh, they led, uh, led the group in really there a few moments ago. Uh, talk to us about the president's cabinet, who's here tonight. That's right. We saw Lloyd Austin. Of course, he is over, uh, has a big role right now, given uh, the situation in Ukraine, as does uh, the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. Uh, you almost, if you, you look at their faces, you know, you, you wonder what's going on in their minds because they're dealing with so much on their fronts. Uh, I believe I've also seen uh, this uh, energy secretary. I've seen uh, the uh, education secretary, uh, all of them seem to be there and in support of Biden, of course, uh, except the designated survivor, which James just talked about. Um, this, this shows, this is different from last year because everyone did not come and that, of course, was because of COVID restrictions. Uh, but this is uh, an important moment for the president to have uh, his people behind him sitting there uh, as part of this audience tonight. Um, this is, uh, you definitely will probably want to look at Lloyd Austin's face if uh, President Biden talks about our troops or look at Antony Blinken's face uh, as the Ukraine issue is mentioned. Um, it, it's, it, it's certainly uh, an incredible night. So many issues that the president's going to have to go over and uh, he has most of his cabinet there. James. The president will speak in just a few minutes. We do expect him to come into the House chamber shortly. It, it still feels roomy in here. You know, Rhonda's talked about how many more people are here than were here last year. But the State of the Union, to me, has this feel of packed to the gills. When I've been there inside the chamber, it is elbow to elbow. And, and there's something that's, that's really robust and alive about that. Tonight, things can breathe. It, yeah, it, it really does take on an energy of, of its own when you're in the chamber, even when only half the members are applauding for something, you can really, I mean, it gets, it just gets physically hot in there under the television Klieg lights with everyone there. And it's not quite at full capacity. Uh, and that, that does have an impact on the room, on the speaker. It's one of those things where it's really hard to rehearse for a State of the Union because you're talking you know, to yourself and there's this audience and you don't know who's going to applaud or how long they're going to applaud for. And sometimes lawmakers stand up for things that presidents don't expect them to stand up for. And sometimes presidents think they have an applause line or a standing ovation line and they, they don't get it either because they don't deliver it right or because it just sort of falls flat in the delivery. So that's one of the reasons it's so fun to watch these uh, because there's so much, you know, the, it, we, we see the justices there, Justice Amy Coney Barrett and Justice Brett Kavanaugh during Barack Obama's State of the Union in 2010. The president uh, was criticizing the Citizens United decision and uh, Justice Sam Alito said, you're lying. Uh, you could hear him mouthing it. You could see him mouthing it. Uh, so you never know what you're going to get when you bring all these very powerful people into this august chamber. 
Dan, you know, watching the dynamics, watching even this moment here, seeing you know a senator get to speak to the chief justice, seeing there the the soon to be retired justice, there is this moment that reflects on democracy and the American spirit. You know, uh, watching the collegiality, watching the senators process through Statuary Hall and seeing a Republican standing next to a Democrat. Do, do you hold out hope to see moments of collegiality and unity tonight? I do, and I think that certainly, as, as has been said, I think that on Ukraine there will be a fair amount of unity. There may be some criticism on the Republican side of things that Biden, uh, that they think Biden didn't do or should have done. Uh, but in the in the in the sense of being united against Putin and Russia, uh, there's there's very few dissenters on that part. And I I would think that when the president is speaking about that, we will see. Uh, that unity. I, th I think the other question is whether there is any unity at all on any pieces of the domestic agenda, um, because we know the divisions there have been so sharp and that the Republicans, with the exception of the infrastructure package, have been wholly opposed to the things that the, the president has tried to do. Um, and so that, I think that will be the real measure. But I mean, it's, it's always fascinating on a night like this, on this particular night, uh, when, when in essence the three branches of government are all in the House chamber. Um, and mingling together in ways that they never otherwise would do. And there is there is a sort of a, a friendliness about it, even though um, the minute they step out of the chamber tonight, they will kind of go back to their own their own barricades and, and uh, resume the, the battling that they've been going on. But but for for at least a few moments, uh, and frankly, until the speech starts, uh, there is there is a sense of camaraderie and, and a kind of a, a notion that, that, that this is the community of our of our constitutional government. Dan, that should not be remarkable, but given the insurrection in the Capitol last year, given uh, some of the threats that lawmakers have said they have felt under, even by members uh, of, of Congress themselves, uh, it, it is still important, Dan. It, it is very important, and you know we are we are obviously not that far away from January sixth, and and uh, those you know those wounds are still open and raw um, for many people. Um, and uh, again, I say I I don't think a night like this uh, goes at all to erase that. Um, but it is the moment for the president to try to speak to the country uh, and for the people in the legislative branch to begin to give some sense of a reaction. The president of the United States. President Biden greeting members of Congress as he comes through that center aisle. Getting a seat on the center aisle has traditionally been a hot seat to be on. As you get a moment with the president of the United States, you see a lot of blue and yellow there. Uh, members of the House and Senate wearing the colors of Ukraine to support that country as it withstands the attacks by Russia. You're also seeing a lack of masks. Only a handful of members wearing masks tonight. Uh, they are no longer required in the House chamber. And uh, the optics of this moment will be something that, uh, that the president can certainly speak to as he talks about the coronavirus pandemic two years in. This is live coverage from The Washington Post. We will be bringing you tonight's speech, the Republican response, as well as analysis after President Biden's first State of the Union.
members of Congress, I have the high privilege and distinct honor of presenting to you the President of the United States. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, General. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Please. Thank you so much. Madam Speaker, Madam Vice President, and our First Lady and Second Gentlemen, members of Congress and the Cabinet, Justice of the Supreme Court, my fellow Americans. Last year, COVID-19 kept us apart. This year, we're finally together again. Tonight, <laughs> tonight we meet as Democrats, Republicans, and Independents but most importantly, as Americans. With the duty to one another, to America, to the American people, and to the Constitution, and an unwavering resolve that freedom will always triumph over tyranny. Six Thank you. Six days ago, Russia's Vladimir Putin sought to shake the very foundations of the free world, thinking he could make it bend to his menacing ways. But he badly miscalculated. He thought he could roll into Ukraine and the world would roll over. Instead, he met with a wall of strength he never anticipated or imagined. He met the Ukrainian people. President Zelensky, to, their, to every Ukrainian, their fearlessness, their courage, their determination literally inspires the world. Groups of citizens blocking tanks with their bodies, everyone from students to retirees to teachers, turned soldiers defending their homeland. And in this struggle, President Zelensky said in his speech to the European Parliament, Light will win over darkness. The Ukrainian ambassador to the United States is here tonight, sitting with the First Lady. Let each of us, if you're able to stand, stand and send an unmistakable signal to the world of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Right, she's strong, and she's resolved. Yes. We, the United States of America, stand with the Ukrainian people. Throughout our history, we've learned this lesson. When dictators do not pay a price for their aggression, they cause more chaos. They keep moving, and the cost, the threats to the America and America to the world keeps rising. That's why the NATO alliance was created, to secure peace and stability in Europe after World War II. The United States is a member, along with 29 other nations. It matters. American diplomacy matters. American resolve matters. Putin's latest attack on Ukraine was premeditated and totally unprovoked. He rejected repeated, repeated efforts at diplomacy. He thought the West and NATO wouldn't respond. 
He thought he could divide us at home, in this chamber, in this nation. He thought he could divide us in Europe as well. But Putin was wrong. We are ready. We are united, and that's what we did. We stayed united. We prepared extensively and carefully. We spent months building coalitions of other freedom loving nations in Europe and the Americas, to, from America to the Asian and African continents, to confront Putin. Like many of you, I spent countless hours unifying our European allies. We shared with the world in advance what we knew Putin was planning and precisely how we would try to falsify and justify his aggression. We countered Russia's lies with the truth. And now, now that he's acted, the three free world is holding him accountable, along with 27 members of the European Union, including France, Germany, Italy, as well as countries like the United Kingdom, Canada, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and many others, even Switzerland, are inflicting pain on Russia and supporting the people of Ukraine. Putin is now isolated from the world more than he has ever been. Together, 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 along with our allies, we are right now enforcing powerful economic sanctions. We're cutting off Russia's largest banks in the international financial system preventing Russia's central bank from defending the Russian ruble, ruble, making Putin's $630 billion war fund worthless. We're choking Russia's access. We're choking Russia's access to technology that will sap its economic strength and weaken its military for years to come. Tonight, I say to the Russian oligarchs and the corrupt leaders who built billions of dollars off this violent regime, no more. The United States — I mean it. The United States Department of Justice is assembling a dedicated task force to go after the crimes of the Russian oligarchs. We're joining with European allies to find and seize their yachts, their luxury apartments, their private jets. We're coming for you, ill-begotten gains. And tonight, I'm announcing that we will join our allies in closing off American airspace to all Russian flights, further isolating Russia and adding additional squeeze on their economy. He has no idea what's coming. The ruble has already lost 30 percent of its value. The Russian stock market has lost 40 percent of its value, and trading remains suspended. The Russian economy is reeling, and Putin alone is the one to blame. Together with our allies, we're providing support to the Ukrainians in their fight for freedom. Military assistance, economic assistance, humanitarian assistance. We're giving more than a billion dollars of direct assistance to Ukraine, and we'll continue to aid the Ukrainian people as they defend their country and help ease their suffering. But let me be clear. Our forces are not engaged and will not engage in the conflict with Russian forces in Ukraine. Our forces are not going to Europe to fight Ukraine, but to defend our NATO allies in the event that Putin decides to keep moving west. For that purpose, we have mobilized American ground forces, air squadrons, ship deployments to protect NATO countries, including Poland, Romania, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. And as I've made crystal clear, the United States and our allies will defend every inch of territory that is NATO territory with the full force of our collective power. Every single inch. And we're clear eyed. The Ukrainians are fighting back with pure courage. But the next few days, weeks, and months will be hard on them. Putin has unleashed violence and chaos. But while he may make gains on the battlefield, 
he'll pay a continuing high price over the long run. And a pound of Ukrainian people, the proud, proud people, pound for pound, ready to fight with every inch of energy they have. They've known 30 years of independence, have repeatedly shown that they will not tolerate anyone who tries to take their country backwards. To all Americans, I'll be honest with you, as I always promised I would be, a Russian dictator of fa invading a foreign country has cost around the world. And I'm taking robust action to make sure the pain of our sanctions is targeted at Russian economy and that we use every tool at our disposal to protect American businesses and consumers. Tonight, I can announce the United States has worked with 30 other countries to release 60 million barrels of oil from reserves around the world. America will lead that effort, releasing 30 million barrels of our own strategic petroleum reserve. And we stand ready to do more if necessary, united with our allies. These steps will help blunt gas prices here at home, but I know news about what's happening can seem alarming to all Americans. But I want you to know we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. When the history of this era is written, Putin's war in Ukraine will have left Russia weaker and the rest of the world stronger. Well, And while it shouldn't and while it shouldn't have taken well it shouldn't have taken something so terrible for people around the world to see what's at stake now everyone sees it clearly we see the unity among leaders of nations a more unified europe a more unified west we see unity among the people who are gathering in cities and large crowds around the world, even in Russia, to demonstrate their support for the people of Ukraine. In the battle between democracy and autocracies, democracies are rising to the moment, and the world is clearly choosing the side of peace and security. This is the real test, and it's going to take time. So let us continue to draw inspiration from the iron will of the Ukrainian people to our fellow Ukrainian Americans who forged the deep bond that connects our two nations. We stand with you. We stand with you. Putin may circle Kyiv with tanks, but he'll never gain the hearts and souls of the Iranian people. He'll never, he'll never extinguish their love of freedom, and he will never, never weaken the resolve of the free world. We meet tonight in an America that has lived through two of the hardest years this nation has ever faced. The pandemic has been punishing, and so many families are living paycheck to paycheck, struggling to keep up with the rising cost of food, gas, housing, and so much more. I understand, like many of you did. My dad had to leave his home in Scranton, Pennsylvania, to find work. So like many of you, I grew up in a family when the price of food went up. It was felt throughout the family. It had an impact. That's when one of the first things I did as president was fight to pass the American Rescue Plan. Because people were hurting, we needed to act, and we did. Few pieces of legislation have done more at a critical moment in our history to lift us out of a crisis. It fueled our efforts to vaccinate the nation and combat COVID-19, delivered immediate economic relief to tens of millions of Americans. It helped put food on the table. Remember those long lines of cars waiting for hours just to get a box of food put in their trunk? It cut the cost of health care insurance. And as my dad used to say, it gave the people just a little bit of breathing room. Unlike the $2 trillion tax cut passed in the previous administration that benefited the top 1 percent of Americans, the American Rescue Plan — the American Rescue Plan help working people, and left no one behind. <laughs> Folks, and it worked. It worked. <laughs> it worked.
We've created jobs, lots of jobs. In fact, our economy created over 6.5 million new jobs just last year. More jobs in one year than ever before in the history of the United States of America. The economy grew at a rate of 5.7 last year, the strongest growth rate in 40 years, and the first step in bringing fundamental change to our economy that hasn't worked for working people in this nation for too long. For the past 40 years, we were told that tax break for those at the top and benefits would trickle down and everyone would, would benefit. But that trickle-down theory led to a weaker economic growth, lower wages, bigger deficits, and a widening gap between the top and everyone else in, in, in nearly a century. Look, <laughs> Vice President Harris and I ran for office, and I realize we have fundamental disagreements on this, but ran for office with a new economic vision for America. Invest in America. Educate Americans. Grow the workforce. Build the economy from the bottom up and the middle out, not from the top down. Because we know. Because we know. Because we know when the middle class grows, when the middle class grows, the poor have a way up and the wealthy do very well. America used to have the best roads, bridges, and airports on Earth. And now our infrastructure is ranked 13th in the world. We won't be able to compete for the jobs of the 21st century if we don't fix it. That's why it was so important to pass the bipartisan infrastructure law. And I thank my Republican friends who joined to invest and rebuild America, the single biggest investment in history. It was a bipartisan effort, and I want to thank the members of both parties who worked to make it happen. We're done talking about infrastructure weeks. We're now talking about an infrastructure decade. And look, it's going to it's going to transform America to put us in a path to win the economic competition of the 21st century that we face with the rest of the world, particularly China. I've told Xi Jinping it's never been a good bet to bet against the American people. We'll create good jobs for millions of Americans, modernizing roads, airports, ports, waterways, all across America. And we'll do it to withstand the devastating effects of climate change and promote environmental justice. We'll build a national network of 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations, begin to replace the poisonous lead pipes so every child, every American has clean water to drink at home and at school. We're going to provide, provide affordable, high-speed Internet for every American, rural, suburban, urban, and tribal communities. 4,000 projects have already been announced. Many of you have announced them in your districts. And tonight, I'm announcing that this year, we will start fixing over 65,000 miles of highway and 1,500 bridges in disrepair. And folks, when we use Taxpayers' dollars to rebuild America, we're going to do it by buying America. Buy American products. Support American jobs. The federal government spends about $600 billion a year to keep this country safe and secure. There's been a law on the books for almost a century to make sure taxpayers' dollars support American jobs and businesses. Every administration, Democrat and Republican, says they'll do it, but we're actually, we're actually doing it. We'll buy America to make sure every, everything from the deck of an aircraft carrier to the steel on highway guardrails is made in America from beginning to end. All of it. All of it. But, folks, To compete for the jobs of the future, we also need a loving playing field with China and other competitors. That's why it's so important 
to pass the Bipartisan Innovation Act sitting in Congress that will make record investments in emerging technologies and American manufacturing. We used to invest almost 2 percent of our GDP in research and development. We don't now. Can't. China is. Let me give you one example why it's so important to pass. If you travel 20 miles east of Columbus, Ohio, you'll find 1,000 empty acres of land. It won't look like much, but if you stop and look closely, you'll see a field of dreams, the ground in which America's future will be built. That's where Intel, the American company that helped build Silicon Valley, is going to build a $20 billion semiconductor megasite, up to eight state-of-the-art factories in one place, 10,000 new jobs. And in those factories, the average job about $135, $135,000 a year. Some of the most sophisticated manufacturing in the world to make com computer chips the size of a fingertip, the power of the world in everyday lives, from smartphones, technology, that is, the internet, technology is yet to be invented. But that's just the beginning. Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger who is here tonight. I don't know where Pat is. Pat, there you go. Pat, stand up. <laughs> Pat. Pat came to see me, and he told me they're ready to increase their investment from $20 billion to $100 billion. That would be the biggest investment in manufacturing in American history. And all they're waiting for is for you to pass this bill. So let's not wait any longer. Send it to my desk. I'll sign it. And we'll really take off in a big way. And folks, Intel is not alone. There's something happening in America. Just look around, and you'll see an amazing story. The rebirth of pride that comes from stamping products made in America, the revitalization of American manufacturing. Companies are choosing to build new factories here when just a few years ago they would have gone overseas. That's what's happening. Ford is investing $11 billion in electric vehicles, creating 11,000 jobs across the country. GM is making the largest investment in its history. $7 billion to build electric vehicles, creating 4,000 jobs in Michigan. All told, 369,000 new manufacturing jobs were created in America last year alone. <laughs> Folks, powered by people I've met like JoJo Burgess, from generations of union steelworkers in Pittsburgh, who's here with us tonight. Where are you, JoJo? There you go. Thanks, buddy. As Ohio, as Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown says, as Sherrod Brown says, it's time to bury the label Rust Belt. It's time to see the the what used to be called a Rust Belt become the the the, the, the home of a significant resurgence of manufacturing. And with all the bright spots in our economy, record job growth, higher wages, too many families are struggling to keep up with their bills. Inflation is robbing them of gains they thought otherwise they would be able to feel. I get it. That's why my top priority is getting prices under control. Look, our economy roared back faster than almost anyone predicted. But the pandemic meant that businesses had a hard time hiring enough people because of the pandemic to keep up production in their factories. So you didn't have people making those beams that went into buildings because they were out. The factory was closed. The panic also disrupted the global supply chain. Factories close. When that happens, it takes longer to make goods and get them to the warehouses, to the stores, and go, prices go up. Look at cars last year. One-third of all the inflation was because of automobile sales. There weren't enough semiconductors to make all the cars that people wanted to buy. And guess what? Prices of automobiles went way up. 
especially used vehicles as well. And so we have a choice. One way to fight inflation is to drive down wages and make Americans poorer. I think I have a better idea to fight inflation. Lower your costs, not your wages. And folks, that means make more cars and semiconductors in America, more infrastructure and innovation in America, more goods moving faster and cheaper in America, more jobs where you can earn a good living in America. Instead of relying on foreign supply chains, let's make it in America. Look, economists, increasing the productive capacity of our, economy, of our economy. I call it building a better America. <laughs> My plan to fight inflation will lower your cost and lower the deficit. 17 Nobel laureates in economics said my plan will ease long-term inflationary pressures. Top business leaders, and I believe most Americans support the plan. And here's the plan. First, cut the cost of prescription drugs. We pay more for the same drug produced by the same company in America than any other country in the world. Just look at insulin. One in 10 Americans has diabetes. In Virginia, I met a 13-year-old boy, the handsome young man standing up there, Joshua Davis. He and his dad both have type 1 diabetes, which means they need insulin every single day. Insulin costs about $10 a vial to make. That's what it costs the, the pharmaceutical company. But drug companies charge families like Joshua and his dad up to 30 times that amount. I spoke with Joshua's mom. Imagine what it's like to look at your child who needs insulin to stay healthy and have no idea how in God's name you're going to be able to pay for it. What it does to your family, but what it does to your dignity, your ability to look your child in the eye, to be the parent you expect yourself to be. I really mean to think about that. That's what I think about. You know, yesterday, Joshua was here tonight, but yesterday was his birthday. Happy birthday, buddy, by the way. <clears throat> for Joshua, and 200,000 other young people with type 1 diabetes, let's cap the cost of insulin at $35 a month so everyone can afford it. And drug companies will do very, very well, their profit margin. While we're at it, I know we have great disagreements on this floor with this. Let's let Medicare negotiate the price of prescription drugs. They already set the price for VA drugs. Look, the American Rescue Plan is helping millions of families with Affordable Care Act plans to save them $2,400 a year on their health premiums. Let's close the coverage gap and make these savings permanent. And second, let's cut energy costs for families an average of $500 a year by combating climate change. Let's provide an investment tax credit to weatherize your home and your business, to be energy efficient and get a tax credit for it. Double America's clean energy production in solar, wind, and so much more. Lower the price of electric vehicles, saving another $80 a month that you're not going to have to pay at the pump. <laughs> Folks. Third. The third thing we can do to change the standard of living for hardworking folks is cut the cost of child care. Cut the cost of child care. Folks, 
If you live in a major city in America, you pay up to $14,000 a year for child care per child. I was a single dad for five years, raising two kids. I had a lot of help, though. I had a mom, a dad, a brother, and a sister that really helped. But middle class and working folks shouldn't have to pay more than 7 percent of their income to care for the young children. My plan, my plan would cut the cost of child care in half for most families and help parents, including millions of women who left the workforce during the pandemic because they couldn't afford child care, to be able to get back to work, generating economic growth. But my plan doesn't stop there. It also includes home and long-term care, more affordable housing, pre-K for three- and four-year-olds. <clears throat> All these will lower costs for families. And under my plan, nobody — let me say this again — nobody earning less than $400,000 a year will pay an additional penny in new taxes. Not a single penny. <clears throat> I may be wrong, but my guess is if we took a secret ballot in this floor, that we'd all agree that the present tax system ain't fair. We have to fix it. I'm not looking to punish anybody, but let's make corporations and wealthy Americans start paying their fair share. Look, last year, last year, And like Chris Coons and Tom Carper and my distinguished Congresswoman, we come from the land of corporate America. There are more corporations incorporated in America than every other state in America combined. And I still won 36 years in a row. The point is, even they understand they should pay just a fair share. Last year, 55 of the Fortune 500 companies earned $40 billion in profit and paid zero in federal taxes. Now, look, it's not fair. That's why I proposed the 15 percent minimum tax rate for corporations. We've got — and that's why in the G7 and other meetings overseas, we were able to put together — I was able to be somewhat helpful — 130 countries degree on a global minimum tax rate. So companies can't get out of paying their taxes at home by shipping jobs in factories overseas. It'll raise billions of dollars. And that's why I propose closing loopholes for the very wealthy who don't pay — who pay a lower tax rate than a teacher and a firefighter. So that's my plan, but we have to go more detail later. I'm going to grow — we will grow the economy, lower the cost of families. So what are we waiting for? Let's get this done. We all know we've got to make changes. <clears throat> Folks, and while you're at it, confirm my nominees for the Federal Reserve, which plays a critical role in fighting inflation. My plan will not only lower costs and give families a fair shot, it will lower the deficit. The previous administration not only ballooned the deficit with those tax cuts for the very wealthy in corporations, it undermined the watchdogs, the job of those to keep pandemic relief funds being wasted. Remember we had those debates about whether or not those watchdogs should be able to see every day how much money was being spent, where was it going to the right place? <clears throat> in my administration, the watchdogs are back. And we're going to go after the criminals who stole billions of relief money meant for small business and millions of Americans. And tonight, I'm announcing that the Justice Department will soon name a chief prosecutor for pandemic fraud. <clears throat> Look. I think we all agree. Thank you. By the end of this year, the deficit will be down to less than half of what it was before I took office. The only president ever to cut the deficit by more than $1 trillion in a single year. Lowering your cost also meant demanding more competition. I'm a capitalist, but capitalism without competition is not capitalism. Capitalism without competition is exploitation. It drives up profits. 
When corporations have to compete, their profits go up and your prices go up when they don't have to compete. Small businesses and family farmers and ranchers, I need not tell some of my Republican friends from those states. Guess what? You got four basic meatpacking facilities. That's it. You play with them or you don't get to play at all. And you pay a hell of a lot more. A hell of a lot more because there's only four. See what's happening with ocean carriers <clears throat> moving goods in and out of America. During the pandemic, about half a dozen or less foreign-owned companies raised prices by as much as 1,000 percent and made record profits. Tonight, I'm announcing a crackdown on those companies overcharging American businesses and consumers. And folks, And as Wall Street firms take over more nursing homes, quality in those homes has gone down and costs have gone up. That ends on my watch. Medicare is going to set higher standards for nursing homes and make sure your loved ones get the care they deserve and that they inspect and they will look at closely. We're also going to cut costs to keep the economy going strong and giving workers a fair shot, provide more training and apprenticeships, hire them based on skills, not just their degrees. Let's pass the Paycheck Fairness Act and paid leave. Raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. And extend the child tax credit so no one has to raise the family in poverty. Let's increase Pell Grants, increase our historic support for HBCUs, and invest in what Jill our First Lady, who teaches full-time, calls America's best-kept secret community colleges. Look, let's pass the PRO Act. When a majority of workers want to form a union, they shouldn't be able to be stopped. When we invest in our workers and we build an economy from the bottom up and the middle out together, we can do something we haven't done in a long time, build a better America. For more than two years, COVID has impacted every decision in our lives and the life of this nation. And I know you're tired, frustrated, and exhausted. That doesn't even count the close to a million people who sit at a dining room table or a kitchen table and look at an empty chair because they lost somebody. But I also know this. Because of the progress we've made, because of your resilience and the tools that we have been provided by this Congress, Tonight, I can say we're moving forward safely back to a no, norm, more normal routines. We've reached a new moment in the fight against COVID-19, where severe cases are down to a level not seen since July of last year. Just a few days ago, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention issued a new mask guidelines. Under the new guidelines, most Americans and most of the country can now go mask-free. And based on projections, and based on projections, more of the country will reach a point across that point across the next couple of weeks. And thanks to the progress we've made in the past year, COVID-19 no longer need control our lives. I know some are talking about living with COVID-19, but tonight I say that we never will just accept living with COVID-19. We'll continue to combat the virus as we do other diseases. And because this virus mutates and spreads, we have to stay on guard. And here are four common-sense steps as we move forward safely, in my view. First, stay protected with vaccines and treatments. We know how incredibly effective vaccines are. If you're vaccinated and boosted, you have the highest degree of protection. And we'll never give up on vaccinating more Americans. Now, I know parents with kids under five are eager to see their vaccines authorized for their children. Scientists are working hard to get that done. We'll be ready with plenty of vaccines if and when they do. We're all ready. We, we are also ready with antiviral treatments. If you get COVID-19, the Pfizer pill reduces your chances of ending up in the hospital by 90 percent. I've ordered more pills than anyone in the world has. Pfizer is working overtime to get us a million pills this month and more than double that next month. And now we're launching the Test to Treat initiative. So people can get tested at a pharmacy, and if they prove positive, receive the antiviral pills on the spot at no cost. 
And folks, <clears throat> if you're immo if you're immunocompromised or have some other vulnerability, we have treatments and free high-quality masks. We're leaving no one behind or ignoring anyone's needs as we move forward. On testing, we've made hundreds of millions of tests available, and you can order them for free to your doorstep. And we've already ordered free tests. If you already ordered free tests tonight, I'm announcing you can order another group of tests. COVID, go to covidtest.gov starting next week, and you can get more tests. Second, we must prepare for new variants. Over the past, we've gotten much better at detecting new variants. If necessary, we'll be able to develop new vaccines within 100 days instead of maybe months or years. And if Congress presides the funds we need, we'll have new stockpiles of tests, masks, pills ready if needed. I can't promise a new variant won't come, but I can, I can promise you we'll do everything within our power to be ready if it does. Third, <clears throat> We can end the shutdown of schools and businesses. We have the tools we need. It's time for America to get back to work and fill our great downtowns again with people. People working from home can feel safe and begin to return to their offices. We're doing that here in the federal government. The vast majority of federal workers will once again work in person. Our schools are open. Let's keep it that way. Our kids need to be in school. <clears throat> With 75% of, of adult Americans fully vaccinated and hospitalizations down by 77%, most Americans can remove their masks and stay in the classroom and move forward safely. We achieved this because we provided free vaccines, treatments, tests, and masks. Of course, continuing this costs money, so I'll not surprise you. I'll be back to see you all. And re I'm going to soon send a request to Congress the vast majority of Americans have used these tools and may want again. We may need them again. So I expect Congress, and I hope you'll pass that quickly. Fourth, we'll continue vaccinating the world. We've sent 475 million vaccine doses to 112 countries, more than any nation on Earth. We won't stop. <clears throat> because you can't build a wall high enough to keep out a a, a, a vaccine, the vaccine can stop the spread of these diseases. You know, we've lost so much in COVID-19, time with one another, the worst of all, the much the loss of life. Let's use this moment to reset. So stop looking at COVID as a partisan dividing line. See it for what it is, a god-awful disease. Let's stop sending each, seeing each other as enemies and start seeing each other for who we are, fellow Americans. Look. <laughs> we, we can't change how divided we've been. There's a long time in coming. But we can change how to move forward on COVID-19 and other issues that we must face together. I recently visited New York City Police Department days after the funerals of Officer Wilbur Mora and his partner, Officer Jason Rivera. They were responding to a 9-11 call when a man shot and killed them with a stolen gun. Officer Mora was 27 years old. Officer Rivera was 22 years old. Both Dominican-Americans who grew up in the same streets that they later chose to parole uh, to uh, patrol as police officers. I spoke with their families, and I told them they were forever in debt for their sacrifices and will carry on their mission to restore the trust and safety of every community deserves. Like some of you that have been around for a while, I've worked with you on these issues for a long time. I know what works, investigating crime prevention and community policing, Cops who walk the beat, who know the neighborhood, and who can restore trust and safety. 
Let's not abandon our streets or choose between safety and equal justice. Let's come together and protect our communities, restore trust, and hold law enforcement accountable. That's why the Justice Department has required body cameras, banned choke calls, and restricted no-knocks warrants for its officers. That's why the American Rescue Plan that you all provided $350 billion that cities, states, and counties can use to hire more police, invest in more proven strategies. <laughs> proven strategies like Proven strategies like community violence interruption, trusted messengers breaking the cycle of violence and trauma, and giving young people some hope. We should all agree the answer is not to defund the police. Right. It's to fund the police. <laughs> fund them. Fund them. Fund them with resources and training. Resources and training they need to protect our communities. I ask Democrats and Republicans alike to pass my budget and keep our neighborhoods safe. And we'll do everything in my power to crack down on gun trafficking, of ghost guns that you can buy online, assemble at home, no serial numbers, can't be traced. I ask Congress to pass proven measures to reduce gun violence. Pass universal background checks. Why should anyone on the terrorist list be able to purchase a weapon? Why? Why? And folks, ban assault weapons with high capacity magazines that hold up to 100 rounds. You think the deer are wearing Kevlar vests? Look, repeal the liability shield that makes gun manufacturers the only industry in America that can't be sued. The only one. Imagine had we done that with the tobacco manufacturers. These laws don't infringe on the Second Amendment. They save lives. The most fundamental right in America is the right to vote and have it counted. And look, it's under assault. In state after state, new laws have been passed. Not only to suppress the vote, we've been there before, but to subvert the entire election. We can't let this happen. Tonight, I call on the Senate to pass, pass the Freedom to Vote Act, pass the John Lewis Act, Voting Rights Act. And while you're at it, pass the Disclose Act so Americans know who's funding our election. Look, tonight, I'd, I'd like to honor someone who dedicated his life to serve this country, Justice Breyer, an Army veteran, constitutional scholar, retiring justice of the United States Supreme Court. Justice Breyer, thank you for your service. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean it. Get up. Stand let him see you. Thank you. And we all know, no matter what your ideology, we all know one of the most serious constitutional responsibility a president has is nominating someone to serve on the United States Supreme Court. As I did four days ago, I've nominated the Circuit Court of Appeals, Katanji Brown Jackson, one of our nation's top legal minds. Will continue in just broad Justice Breyer's legacy of excellence. A former top litigator in private practice, a former federal public defender, from a family of public school educators and police officers. She's a consensus builder. Since she's been nominated, she's received a broad range of support, including the Fraternal Order of Police and former judges supported by Democrats and Republicans. Folks, if we are to advance liberty and justice, we need to secure our border and fix the immigration system. And as you might guess, I think we can do both. At our border, 
We've installed new technology like cutting-edge scanners to better detect drug smuggling. We've set up joint patrols with Mexico and Guatemala to catch more human traffickers. We're putting in place dedicated immigration judges in a significant larger number so families fleeing persecution and violence can have their curses, cases heard faster and those who don't legitimately hear can be sent back. We're screening, we're securing commitments and supporting partners in South and Central America to host more refugees and secure their own borders. We can do all this while keeping lit the torch of liberty that has led the generation of immigrants to this land, my forebears and many of yours. Provide a pathway to citizenship for dreamers, those with temporary status, farm workers, essential workers. Revise our laws so businesses have workers they need and families don't wait decades to reunite. It's not only the right thing to do, it's economically smart thing to do. That's why the immigration reform is supported by everyone from labor unions to religious leaders to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Let's get it done once and for all. Folks, advancing liberty and justice also requires protecting the rights of women. The constitutional right affirmed by Roe v. Wade, standing precedent for half a century, is under attack as never before. If you want to go forward, not backwards, we must protect access to health care, preserve a woman's right to choose, and continue to advance maternal health care for all Americans. And folks, for our LGBTQ plus Americans, let's finally get the Bipartisan Equality Act to my desk. The onslaught of state laws targeting transgender Americans and their families. It's simply wrong. And I said last year, especially to our younger transgender Americans, I'll always have your back as your president so you can be yourself and reach your God-given potential. <laughs> Folks, as I've just demonstrated, while well, it often appears we do not agree, <laughs> and that we, we do agree on a lot more things than we acknowledge. I signed 80 bipartisan bills in the law last year, from preventing government shutdowns, to protecting aging Americans from still too common hate crimes, to reforming military justice, and will soon be strengthening the Violence Against Women Act that I first wrote three decades ago. It's important. It's important for us to show, to show the nation we can come together and do big things. So tonight I'm offering a unity agenda for the nation. Four big things we can do together, in my view. First, beat the opioid epidemic. There's so much we can do. Increase funding for prevention, treatment, harm reduction and recovery, get rid of outdated rules and stop doctors and, and the, that stop doctors from prescribing treatments. Stop the flow of illicit drugs by working with state and local law enforcement to go after the traffickers. And if you're suffering from addiction, you know you should know you're not alone. I believe in recovery and I celebrate the 23 million, 23 million Americans in recovery. Second, Let's take on mental health, especially among our children whose lives and education have been turned upside down. The American Rescue Plan gave schools money to hire teachers and help students make up for lost learning. I urge every parent to make sure your school, your school does just that. They have the money. We can all play a part. Sign up to be a tutor or a mentor. Children were also struggling before the pandemic, bullying, violence, trauma and the harms of social media. As Frances Haugen, who is here tonight with us, has shown, we must hold social media platforms accountable for the national experiment they're conducting on our children for profit. <laughs> Folks, thank you. Thank you for the courage you showed. It's time to strengthen privacy protections, ban targeted advertising to children, yeah. demand tech companies stop 
collecting personal data on our children. And let's get all Americans the mental health services they need. More people can turn for help and full parity between physical and mental health care if we treat it that way in our insurance. Look. The third piece of that agenda is support our veterans. <laughs> veterans are the backbone and the spine of this country. They're the best of us. I've always believed that we have a sacred obligation to equip those we send to war and care for those and their family when they come home. My administration is providing assistance in job training, housing, and now helping lower-income veterans get VA care debt-free. And our troops in Iraq have faced and Afghanistan have faced many dangers, one being stationed at bases breathing in toxic smoke from burn pits. Many of you have been there. I've been in and out of Iraq and Afghanistan over 40 times. These burn pits that incinerate waste, the waste of war, medical and hazards material, jet fuel, and so much more. And they come home, many of the world's fittest and best trained warriors in the world, never the same. Headaches, numbness, dizziness, a cancer that would put them in a flag draped coffin. I know. One of those one of those soldiers was my son, Major Bo Biden. I don't know for sure if the burn pit that he lived near, that his hooch was near in Iraq and earlier than that in Kosovo, is the cause of his brain cancer, the disease of so many other troops. But I am committed to find out everything we can, committed to military families like Danielle Robinson from Ohio, the widow of Sergeant First Class Heath Robinson. He was born a soldier, Army National Guard, combat medic in Kosovo and Iraq, stationed near Baghdad, just yards from burn pits the size of football fields. Danielle is here with us tonight. They love going to Ohio State football games. And they love building Legos with their daughter. But cancer from prolonged exposure to burn pits ravaged Heath's lungs and body. Danielle says Heath was a fighter to the very end. He didn't know how to stop fighting, and neither did she. Through her pain, she found purpose to demand that we do better. Tonight, Danielle, we are going to do better. The VA. The VA is pioneering new ways of linking toxic exposure to disease, already helping more veterans get benefits. And tonight, I'm announcing we're expanding eligibility to veterans suffering from nine respiratory cancers. I'm also calling on Congress to pass a law to make sure veterans devastated by toxic exposure in Iraq and Afghanistan finally get the benefits in the comprehensive health care they deserve. And fourth and last, let's end cancer as we know it. This is personal. This is personal to me and to Jill and to Kamala and so many of you. So many of you have lost someone you love husband, wife, son, daughter, mom, dad. Cancer is the number two cause of death in America, second only to heart disease. Last month, I announced the plan to supercharge the cancer moonshot that President Obama asked me to lead six years ago. Our goal is to cut cancer death rates by at least 50 percent over the next 25 years. I think we can do better than that. Turn cancers from death sentences into treatable diseases. 
more support for patients and their families. To get there, I call on Congress to fund what I called ARPA-H, Advanced, <laughs> Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, patterned after DARPA and the Defense Department, projects that led in DARPA to the Internet, GPS, and so much more to make our forces more safer and be able to wage war more with more clarity. ARPA will have a singular purpose, to drive breakthroughs in cancer, Alzheimer's and diabetes, and more. A unity agenda for the nation. We can do these things. It's within our power. And I don't see a partisan edge to any one of those four things. My fellow Americans, tonight, we've gathered in this sacred space, a citadel of democracy, in this capital, Generation after generation of Americans have debated great questions amid great strife and have done great things. We fought for freedom, expanded liberty, debated totalitarianism and terror. We built the strongest, freest, and most prosperous nation the world has ever known. Now is the hour, our moment of responsibility, our test of resolve and conscience, of history itself, it is in this moment that our character of this generation is formed. Our purpose is found. Our future is forged. Well, I know this nation. We'll meet the test, protect freedom and liberty, expand fairness and opportunity, and we will save democracy. As hard as those times have been, I'm more optimistic about America today than I've been my whole life, because I see the future that's within our grasp, because I know there's simply nothing beyond our, our capacity. We're the only nation on Earth that has always turned every crisis we've faced into an opportunity. The only nation that can be defined by a single word, possibilities. So on this night, on our 245th year as a nation, I've come to report on the state of the nation, the state of the union. And my report is this. The state of the union is strong because you, the American people, are strong. We are stronger today. We are stronger today than we were a year ago. And we'll be stronger a year from now than we are today. This is our moment to meet and overcome the challenges of our time. And we will, as one people, one America, the United States of America. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you. Go get him. President Biden pledging a unity agenda for the nation in his first official State of the Union address. An hour-long speech spanning topics from the war in Ukraine to the opioid epidemic. We see him there greeting people in the chamber. This is live coverage from The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey, and I'm joined tonight by my colleagues on Capitol Hill, outside the White House, and here in the newsroom. Let's go to Joyce Coe for the highlights of tonight's speech. Joyce. Libby, this was really President Biden in his prime. He gave a very clear-eyed delivery of his stance on both Ukraine and his policies here domestically. At times, you know, we have seen President Biden sort of low energy, maybe fumble over his words. But tonight, the tone from Biden was one that conveyed strength. Uh, it projected this sort of steadiness uh, as he discussed what he was doing uh, about the war in Ukraine uh, as far as punishments on Russia and standing with the Ukra Ukrainian people. Um, he was met with this 
uh, energy in the room that was one of collegiality. We saw members of both Republican and Democratic sides standing up to give standing ovations uh, numerous times, especially at the beginning of the speech when he was addressing uh, Ukraine and uh, America's commitment to supporting Ukraine. Um, and one of those moments where he was, uh, where the crowd really stood up and gave this standing ovation was when Biden talked about uh, really squarely to Vladimir Putin saying, quote, Russia's Putin sought to shake the very foundation of the free world, thinking he could make it bend to his menacing ways. He went on to say that Putin thought he could roll into Ukraine and the world would roll over. Instead, he was met with a wall that he never could have anticipated or imagined. He was met with the Ukrainian people. Biden really uh, talking about how strong the Ukrainian people are in this moment where Russia is increasing their aggression against uh, civilians as well as uh, Ukrainian military. He talked about how Ukrainian people are in the streets blocking Russian tanks. Uh, and he also had this really phenomenal moment um, with the Ukrainian ambassador who was the guest of the first lady. And she stood up as he said, uh, you know, make your signal to the world, make your signal to the world as uh, this joint Congress stood up and applauded her uh, in unity. He announced several punishments on Russia, uh, four of them to be exact, including enforcing economic sanctions uh, with allies, of course, cutting off most recently Russia's access to uh, the, the financial world at large, uh, with the most recent sanction being targeting uh, the Russian central bank. He also talked about cutting off Russia's access to technology, saying that it will, quote, sap the Russian economy and weaken its military for years to come. Uh, he announced that the Department of Justice will be establishing a task force to go after Russian oligarchs, saying that, quote, we're joining with our European allies to find and seize your yachts, your luxury apartments. We're coming for your ill-begotten gains. Uh, and, first, and fourth, uh, he mentioned and announced really that he will be joining U.S. allies in closing off U.S. airspace to Russian flights, adding that this will add um, really an additional squeeze on their economy uh, with the ruble already down 30 percent in value. Uh, when he transitioned from talking about Ukraine to the um, to his domestic policy, he really gave a message to the American people, reassuring them that we are going to be OK. He said, quote, when this era of history is written, uh, Putin's war on Ukraine will have left Russia weaker and the rest of the world stronger. Again, projecting strength and resolve in the confidence of the Ukrainian people, the principles of democracy, and really the unity of the U.S. and uh, their allies against Putin uh, and Russian forces that are right now in Ukraine. Uh, you know, he ended this speech by saying the State of the Union is strong, uh, and this is this came after, uh, you know, talking about the importance of democracy, which is one of the things that we were waiting to hear exactly what the president would say on this. Uh, he really doubled down on his commitment to democracy and saying that that is what will overcome the challenges that the nation and really the world currently faces. Libby. Thanks so much. Joyce Co. reporting live outside the White House. We are watching President Biden make a very slow departure from the chamber as he talks to so many people, including Justice Breyer, just a moment ago. Rhonda, that was such a touching moment uh, in the speech when he uh, praised Justice Breyer, the Supreme Court justice slated to retire, who had such a, such a genuine reaction, uh, a, a human reaction. Rhonda, tell us more about some of the highlights tonight and how Congress reacted. Well, you know, out of the gate, uh, when Ukraine was mentioned, when he also mentioned that he would be closing off American airspace to Russian aircraft, uh, you saw a lot of resounding support. You heard claps. You saw people standing. You see that uh, the chamber, both Republicans and Democrats, were standing behind this president on uh, how he wants to take on uh, this issue of Ukraine and helping the Ukrainian people. 
So uh, I, I don't know what it will be when any legislation gets to the floor uh, on Ukraine, whether it be a funding package or something, how that's going to uh, shape up. But for now, they all seem to be in a unified support of the president and his approach to Ukraine. Um, he also uh, discussed Build Back Better without saying Build Back Better. That is that social spending package that he tried to get through uh, earlier in the winter. It, it somewhat failed in negotiations in the Senate. But what he did was pulled out uh, parts of that legislation, uh, bringing down the cost of pharmaceutical uh, drugs. He even had one of his guests, a young boy who needs insulin, and he talked about how his parents have to pay for that insulin, and that should come down. Uh, he also talked about expanding child tax care credits, expanding Medicare. Those are all part of Build Back Better. But he sort of recast it tonight and isn't saying that uh, it's Build Back Better. He's saying these are the issues we'd like to tackle. So we, we'll see if that approach works. Uh, two things that stood out to me, uh, he had Republicans on their feet uh, on two issues that he might be trying to get ahead of in terms of what they are uh, readying as their uh, battle against him for the midterms. One was a phrase where he said, we don't need to defund the police, we need to fund them. I, I saw Kevin McCarthy, uh, the House Minority Leader, stand up. I saw other members of the Republican Party stand up on that line. Also, he called on uh, more immigration reform. I saw Ted Cruz stand up and a number of uh, Republicans in the Senate stand up. So he, he seemed to get ahead of some of the issues that they have been attacking him on uh, and trying to make a, a common sense approach on those issues. Uh, we also learned uh, that he is going to set up a chief prosecutor for a pandemic fraud uh, at the DOJ. That was a part of the speech when he discussed where we are with the pandemic and where we're going. So those were some of the highlights uh, for me, but it, it did seem uh, as if he knew the room. He knew that uh, this is a divided Senate, a divided House, and, and he wanted to give somebody, give every, uh, give things to everyone uh, tonight. Mm. Rhonda Colvin, thank you so much. Uh, about five minutes after President Biden leaves the chamber, we expect to hear the Republican uh, response that will be delivered by the Iowa governor. Let's go to James Homan for more on, uh, on, on your major takeaways from tonight's State of the Union speech. James. It, it was a very striking, moderate tone from the president. Bruce Reed's fingerprints were all over that speech. He is a moderate centrist Democrat from kind of the corporate wing of the party. He was Bill Clinton's top domestic policy advisor, and he helped Bill Clinton reset after big losses for Democrats in the 1994 midterms so that Clinton could win in 1996. It was almost tonight like Biden was acting as if he was approaching a divided government. Rhonda mentioned some of the things, you know, tough on policing, speaking out against uh, defunding the police, speaking out for cracking down on pandemic fraud, tough on immigration, talking about securing the border. Uh, when he talked about abortion and Roe versus Wade, he notably did not use the word abortion, uh, didn't use the term build back better. Uh, it, 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 it really, you know, and then obviously ending uh, with the kind of what he called the unity agenda, the four themes that could bring Republicans and Democrats together, fighting cancer, helping veterans, tackling addiction and mental health. It, it sounded like he's preparing for divided government. It, it really was the most moderate sounding speech we've heard from Joe Biden since he became president. I think it is part of a pivot. I think it is aimed at trying to uh, minimize some of the Democratic Party's losses and clearly aimed at appealing to some of the independents who clearly didn't like Donald Trump, maybe gave Biden a chance in 2020, aren't happy with what they've gotten so far and trying to win some of those voters back. James, such uh, an interesting uh, observation by you moving to anticipate perhaps a divided government uh, because, of course, the midterms are already upon us. There is a primary in Texas today, uh, and that season is already underway. Uh, James, uh, talk to us about President Biden reflecting on accomplishments versus looking at the, the, the goal list of things to do. I thought he actually ended with this, this crescendo that tied it all together. If Biden hit at the very top, said, we're better off than we were a year ago and we're going to be better off a year from now than we are today, it would have sounded a little tone deaf, uh, tin-eared. But, you know, he really did, in the economic sections, lay out the gains that had been made in a way. I thought he successfully threaded the needle where he didn't sound like he was talking about an economy that a lot of Americans don't recognize uh, and did, as we talked about before the speech, try to deflect blame for rising prices to 
corporations. We heard his attack on the meat processing, meat packaging, uh, on the drug companies, and kind of that more populist vibe, but that allowed him ultimately to get to the point where, you know, he, another moderate thing he said was kids should be back in school. Let's turn the page on COVID. Let's change this from pandemic to endemic, which is what a lot of moderate voters poll show want to hear. Rhonda Colvin, let's talk about the optics of tonight. Uh, very few masks in this chamber and a lot of the blue and yellow of Ukraine. The first lady wearing a brilliant blue dress with a little embroidered sunflower right at the wrist, the symbol of Ukraine. Talk to us about symbolism tonight. That's right. You saw a lot of support for Ukraine just in, in the dress uh, here on the, the floor. Uh, you saw uh, ribbons on lapels uh, in the colors of the Ukrainian flag. So these were all symbols to show uh, that this whole chamber is aware of the situation over there and they're standing uh, in solidarity right now. So uh, that and then, of course, the uh, the mask. This was a uh, one of the first times that this chamber has seen a mask optional. Um, regulations before uh, everyone had to be masked on the House floor. Uh, in, in fact, you faced a fine. Uh, lawmakers who did not come masked faced a fine. Now, uh, today, it was mask optional, and it, it looks like uh, just a, a few. I, I, I've only been able to account, account just several uh, who had masks on. So that, again, kind of underscores where Biden wanted to be tonight where he's talking to the American people about we're coming out of the pandemic. It's still with us. We're going to have to be aware uh, that variants could pop up. But for now, uh, the government wants to uh, show that the, the pandemic hopefully is behind us, or at least as endemic, and, and we'll move forward uh, as needed. He also discussed that people can now go on and uh, order more tests from the federal government. That's something he started uh, about a month ago. So now he's saying Americans can sign up for more tests. So uh, the optics uh, tonight, those are always an important part of the State of the Union, seeing what's happening, seeing who's doing what in the chamber. And I can tell you right now, most of the members who have left the chamber are now very near me. I know at the beginning of our show, I said it was very quiet where we were. Not the case right now. We have a lot of lawmakers coming through here to give their reaction, and we hope to talk to a few soon. Great, Rhonda. Thank you. Let's bring in national video reporter Hannah Jewell. So, Hannah, what are we expecting to hear in the Republican response tonight? So we are right now waiting to hear from Kim Reynolds, the governor of Iowa, elected um, in 2016, took, or took power rather in 2017, was previously the lieutenant governor. Um, and what we're going to hear is her contrasting her style of leadership and her decisions um, in Iowa with those of Biden and the Democrats, particularly when it comes to COVID. Iowa has had very few COVID restrictions throughout the pandemic. Um, she has been against masks, vaccine man mandates. She banned schools from being able to implement mask mandates in schools. We can be sure to hear her touch on that, as well as other contrasts, such as how she has you know, oppose the teaching of systemic racism in schools in Iowa. That is the critical race theory sort of talk that is happening right now among Republicans. Um, she has opposed the inclusion of trans kids in sports. We heard Biden um, speaking about that and speaking up for trans kids in his speech. She has limited abortion access. She has actually today cut state taxes. And she's also a staunch, staunch supporter of, of Donald Trump. And we've actually seen a few lines from this speech that she's about to give, at least as it was written before um, Biden's address. And we know from that that she's planning to describe Biden and the Democrats as sending the country back in time to the late 70s and 80s, specifically, uh, a moment that she will describe as a time of high inflation, crime, and Cold War tensions. Um, we can also expect her to speak about the Afghanistan withdrawal and how it, in her words, emboldened our enemies trying to sort of pin the situation on Ukraine, at least some blame on Biden and his um, leadership here in the United States. There was actually a moment that we um, uh, heard in uh, the speech when um, Biden was speaking about uh, veterans and about um, those veterans who have lost their lives. We heard a Republican Congresswoman Lauren Boebert yelling out, uh, you put 13 of them in the ground, or you put them in, as in caskets, 13 of them, a sort of moment followed by uh, Democrats booing. Um, so you see that sort of uh, moment that is happening and that tension there. Um, as for Kim Reynolds, this is going to be the biggest speech of her career so far. Often the rebuttal is used and given to a sort of 
someone who's seen as a rising star in the opposing party. Uh, Kim Reynolds is, you know, she's not a, a young star necessarily. She's a grandma, as I'm sure she will mention, uh, but she is still seen as a potential um, a potential figure to take a, a role in the national stage in the coming years. Um, we sort of, sort of seem to see during Biden's speech how he sort of seemed to go through and try to head off the, these sorts of criticisms at the pass, ahead of midterms, ahead of this rebuttal, ahead of criticism. Um, and particularly, I was struck by when it came to COVID, something that is, you know, so central to Kim Reynolds' sort of reputation as a Republican governor who, um, who handled, you know, COVID so much differently than most of the country. Um, the lack of masks that we saw tonight might, might sort of prevent her being able to claim um, the Democrats are not moving forward in the pandemic, perhaps. So we'll see what she says. Hannah Jewell, thank you so much. Uh, the chamber is clearing out. The president of the United States has just left, and you saw him there doing a couple last handshakes with even the people who were running the cameras there in the House chamber tonight. Uh, let's go uh, to James Homan uh, for more on some of the dynamics at play this evening. You know, James, okay, Hannah explained this, but I, but I want to be very clear about what happened because people, people may have heard somebody yelling out as President Biden was talking about veterans and specifically about his son. Bo Biden, a veteran who has died, died of cancer. And we heard someone yell out. It turns out it's reportable that it was Congresswoman Boebert, as Hannah explained, Republican from Colorado. And uh, as the president was talking about these American warriors in flag-draped coffins, Congresswoman Boebert yelled out 13 of them. And that got boos and sort of a shock response from some members of the chamber because she was yelling this out in the middle of this speech. Yeah, and it, it's not surprising coming from Lauren Boebert uh, from Rifle, Colorado. She defeated Scott Tipton, who was a, a very conservative Republican, and she ran against him from the right in 2020. She's run into lots of trouble with refusing to wear a mask, but also uh, saying that she was carrying a concealed weapon around Washington, D.C., when that's not allowed, uh, and into the Capitol. Uh, it, she, uh, she's someone who's you know, often competing with Marjorie Taylor Greene to, to try and, and get people's attention. And it is unfortunate that this has sort of become a pattern in a lot of these State of the Unions. Uh, you'll remember the 2009 address from Obama uh, to, the, to the Congress where Joe Wilson, the Republican congressman from South Carolina, yelled, you lie, uh, as, as Obama was talking about health care. Uh, and so it, th this is one of those things where it is unfortunate because it helps with fundraising. Yeah, and James, and it, and it does go both ways. I mean, we saw Speaker Pelosi rip up Donald Trump's speech uh, in, in a prior address. Uh, the question is, though, as we watch James for this question of unity, as the president is calling for it, what do those displays do, James? Face this tension. Does he try to be bipartisan Biden, or does he try to be kind of FDR Biden? And there are aides on in both camps. There are people who work for Biden who thinks he should pick a fight with Republicans. He should run against them as the foil, as the bad guy. But Biden's impulse is to try and work with them, to try and reach for common ground, uh, which some on the left think is naive. And you know, when you when you talk about someone like Lauren Boebert, that plays into the hands of people who are saying Biden should run against Republicans in Congress rather than try to extend all of branches. Let's go to Rhonda Colvin briefly, who's up on Capitol Hill. Rhonda. That's right. We're here with Representative Castro, a Democrat from Texas. Uh, this is a busy night for you because it is also a primary night in your state. Yeah. And I just wanted to ask you briefly about that. Do you think the president's, uh, the reaction he got in the chamber today, as well as some of the things that he hit on, is that going to help Democrats in the midterm? I sure hope so. Uh, he gave what I thought was a really strong speech. Uh, there was a lot of uh, bipartisan uh, clapping and standing ovations and uh, he talked about the devastation of the pandemic, but also about how he's helped bring America back and his plan for the coming year. And then, of course, talked about the situation with Russia invading Ukraine, which the world is concerned about. Uh, and he really demonstrated America's leadership in bringing our allies together to condemn what Russia has done. And so all in all, I thought that it was a great night for the president and uh, looking forward to his leadership in the year ahead. Now, you also sit on House Intel, and I know you've had a series of briefings on uh, the situation in Ukraine. What do you think is next legislatively on the Ukraine issue? Uh, well, we're talking about a possible sanctions bill. Uh, as you've seen, uh, the world really at this point has sanctioned Russia. It's unprecedented how swiftly and strongly the world has moved to condemn what they've done. Many of us in Congress were working with the State Department and the U.S. mission at the United Nations today 
to call different embassies and rally for the vote tomorrow at the United Nations on the resolution condemning Russia. Uh, and so we're going to keep putting the pressure on. All right, Representative Castro, thanks so much. Libby? Thank you so much, Rhonda Colvin, live on Capitol Hill. We will continue to check in with Rhonda throughout the night. Momentarily, though, the Republican response that will be by Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds. Uh, stay tuned for that. As we heard Rhonda mention, it is a primary day in Texas today. Uh, here are the, the two big questions, uh, the Democrat and Republican for governor. And the AP is saying that Greg Abbott is projected to win the Republican primary there. Beto O'Rourke protect, projected to win, rather, the Democratic primary in Texas. Other races we are also watching there tonight, and we will talk about later on. Now, the Iowa governor. Good evening. I'm Kim Reynolds, governor of the great state of Iowa. Like you, I just watched the president's address. I listened as the governor of our state, as a mom and a grandmother of 11, who's worried our country is on the wrong track. We're now one year into his presidency, and instead of moving America forward, it feels like President Biden and his party have sent us back in time to the late 70s and early 80s, when runaway inflation was hammering families, a violent crime wave was crashing our cities, and the Soviet army was trying to redraw the world map. Even before taking the oath of office, the president told us that he wanted to, quote, make America respected around the world again, and to unite us here at home. He's failed on both fronts. The disastrous Afghanistan withdrawal did more than cost American lives. It betrayed our allies and emboldened our enemies. North Korea is testing missiles again at an alarming rate. The Speaker of the House recently warned our Olympic athletes not to speak out against China. And now Russia has launched an unprovoked, full-scale military invasion of Ukraine, an attack on democracy, freedom, and the rule of law. Now all Americans must stand united in solidarity with the brave people of Ukraine as they courageously defend their country against Putin's tyranny as they fight for their freedom. But we shouldn't ignore what happened in the run-up to Putin's invasion, waiving sanctions on Russian pipelines while eliminating oil production here at home, focusing on political correctness rather than military readiness, reacting to world events instead of driving them. Weakness on the world stage has a cost, and the president's approach to foreign policy has consistently been too little, too late. It's time for America to once again project confidence. It's time to be decisive. It's time to lead. But we can't project strength abroad if we're weak at home. And that's what I want to discuss with you tonight. The President and Democrats in Congress have spent the last year either ignoring the issues facing Americans or making them worse. They were warned that spending trillions would lead to soaring inflation. They were told that their anti-energy policies would send gas prices to new heights. But they plowed ahead anyway, raising the price at the pump by 50 percent and pushing inflation to a 40-year high. Four decades ago, when our nation was last reeling from inflation, I was a young working mom just starting out. My husband, Kevin, worked days while I watched our girls, and then we would literally switch. We would pass in the yard as he was coming home, and I was leaving to work evenings at the local grocery store. From across that checkout counter, I saw the pain of inflation on my neighbors' faces. I saw what happens when prices rise faster than wages. The Biden administration believes inflation is a, quote, high-class problem. I can tell you, it's an everybody problem. I saw moms and dads' paychecks buy them less and less. I watched working people choose which essentials to take home and which ones to leave behind. And now President Biden's decisions have a whole new generation feeling that same pain. When I took the oath of office five years ago, I promised Iowans that I would never lose sight of who I was working for 
that I wouldn't become detached from the problems they were facing, from the problems that I had faced myself. But you don't have to check groceries to see what high inflation does to people. You just need to step outside of the DC bubble. Talk to Americans about what's on their mind. Ask them, what are your concerns? What keeps you up at night? And they'll tell you. And I can tell you what's not on that list. They won't tell you that spending trillions more and bankrupting their children is the answer to their problems. They won't tell you that we should be paying people not to work. And they certainly won't tell you that we should give billions in tax giveaways to millionaires and billionaires in Democrat-controlled states like California, New York, and New Jersey. But that's what the Biden administration has been pushing for over the last year. And that's all part of Build Back Better. Thankfully, the president's agenda didn't pass because even members of his own party said enough is enough. Well, the American people share that view. Enough is enough. And it's not just with D.C. spending. Americans are tired of a political class trying to remake this country into a place where an elite few tell everyone else what they can and cannot say, what they can and cannot believe. They're tired of people pretending the way to end racism is by categorizing everybody by their race. They're tired of politicians who tell parents they should sit down be silent and let government control their kids' education and future. Frankly, they are tired of the theater, where politicians do one thing when the cameras are rolling and another when they believe you can't see them, where governors and mayors enforce mandates but don't follow them, where elected leaders tell their citizens to stay home while they sneak off to Florida for sun and fun where they demand that your child wear a mask, but they go maskless. So you've heard the excuses. They were just holding their breath, but it's the American people who are waiting to exhale, waiting for the insanity to stop. We now live in a country where violent crime is out of control. Liberal prosecutors are letting criminals off easy and many prominent Democrats still want to defund the police. You know, it seems like everything is backwards. The Biden administration requires vaccines for Americans who want to go to work or protect this country, but not for migrants who illegally cross the border. The Department of Justice treats parents like domestic terrorists, but looters and shoplifters roam free. The American people are left to feel like they're the enemy. This is not the same country it was a year ago. The president tried to paint a different picture tonight, but his actions over the last 12 months don't match the rhetoric. It's not what he promised when he took office. But it doesn't have to be that way. There is an alternative. Across the nation, Republican governors and legislators are showing Americans what conservative leadership looks like, what it means to respect the people we serve, to hear them out, to stand up for them and walk alongside them. We know that our problems require bold action, but we also know that bold action doesn't have to mean government action. It's Americans making their own decisions for their own families and future. Republican governors faced the same COVID-19 virus head on. But we honored your freedoms and saw right away that lockdowns and school closures, they came with their own significant cost, that mandates weren't the answer. And we actually listened to the science, especially with kids in masks and kids in schools. What happened and is still happening to our children over the last two years is unconscionable. Learning loss, isolation, anxiety, depression. In so many states, our kids have been left behind and so many will never catch up. That's why Iowa was the first state in the nation to require that schools open their doors. 
I was attacked by the left. I was attacked by the media. But it wasn't a hard choice. It was the right choice. And keeping schools open is only the start of the pro-parent, pro-family revolution that Republicans are leading in Iowa and states across this country. Republicans believe that parents matter. It was true before the pandemic, and it has never been more important to say out loud, parents matter. They have a right to know and to have a say in what their kids are being taught. Families also have every right to live in a safe and a secure community. And that begins with a safe and secure country. But the Biden administration has refused to secure our border. They've refused to provide the resources to stop human trafficking, to stop the staggering influx of deadly drugs coming into our neighborhoods. They've refused to protect you. With Texas and Arizona leading the way, I, along with Republican governors from several states, have sent resources to the border. And we've actually gone to the border, something that our president and vice president have yet to do since taking office. On the economy, the contrast couldn't be more stark. While Democrats in D.C. are spending trillions, sending inflation soaring, Republican leaders around the country are balancing budgets and cutting taxes because we know that money spent on Main Street is better than money spent on bureaucracy. Today, I signed legislation that eliminates Iowa's tax on retirement income and sets our tax rate at 3.9%. That's less than half of what it was just four years ago. And it shouldn't come as a surprise that out of the top 20 states with the lowest unemployment rates, 17 have Republican governors. Republicans may not have the White House, but we're doing what we can to fill the leadership vacuum. And on the issues that are affecting Americans, Republicans are leading. We're standing up for parents and kids. We're standing up for life. We're keeping our communities safe and thanking those in uniform. We're fighting to restore America's energy independence, and that includes biofuels. We're getting people back to work, not paying them to stay home. Most of all, we're respecting your freedom. Behind me stands Iowa's Capitol, where we display our state motto, our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. And those aren't just empty words. It's a belief that the greatness of this state and this country lies in our people, not government. You shouldn't have to wake up every morning and worry about the next thing the government is going to do to you, your business, or your children. If we as elected leaders are doing our job then the government is working well, but operating in the background. It's supporting the ingenuity and spirit of our people, not drowning them out. It's keeping them safe, not restricting their freedom. That's what I believe, that's what Republicans believe, and that's what Republicans are doing. I am so blessed to be the governor of Iowa, where people are humble, hardworking and patriotic. We take care of each other. And yes, we are, as they say, Iowa nice. But you don't have to be from Iowa to see that those are the values of America at its best, all of America. Over the last few years, I've put my faith in Iowans and they haven't let me down. I encourage this president to do the same to put his faith in you, the American people, who have never wavered in your belief in this country, regardless of who leads it. Because you know, you've shown that the soul of America isn't about who lives in the White House. It's men and women like you in every corner of this nation who are willing to step up and take responsibility 
for your communities, for your neighbors, and ultimately for yourself. By that most important measure at least, the state of our union is indeed strong. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds with the Republican response to President Biden's State of the Union address. Let's go to my colleague Rhonda Colvin now on Capitol Hill. I'm here with Senator Chris Coons of Delaware. Senator Coons, I know you know the president well. Uh, what moment stood out to you? If there was one moment tonight where you think he might have struck that balance of making sure that fatigued Americans who are watching this tonight uh, understand his, his key issues and understand what's next in Ukraine. It's really hard to pick just one moment from what I thought was a really strong speech. In the opening couple of minutes, he spoke forcefully and clearly about what's at risk, not just for Ukrainians, not just for the West, but for the United States as well, in defending the independence, the sovereignty of Ukraine. Um, I think by having the Ukrainian ambassadors as guests, by speaking clearly about the significance of the fight they're putting up, and by condemning Putin's aggression against Ukraine, he started off on a strong footing and helped the average American maybe understand why NATO's future is vital to the United States and to our future. In some ways, what I liked most about his speech was his closing, his unity agenda, where he laid out four things that are genuinely bipartisan, things that impact every American family. Cancer, mental health, dealing with opioid and addiction, and last, supporting our veterans. I think every American family, in some way, was touched by the way he spoke about those four issues and his call to all of us to address them in a meaningful way. Now, you were just in Poland, you were just in, in the region, um, looking firsthand at the situation in Ukraine. You also sit on the Appropriations Committee in the yes. Senate. You're preparing a $10 billion uh, supplemental aid package for the Ukraine issue. How fast is that moving through the Senate? Is it going to move fast? And, you know, can you give us an update on the timeline? Well, the billion-dollar question, or the $10 billion question, is whether we will actually get an omnibus, which is a year-long appropriation bill. I'm urging, and there's dozens of us working on this in the Senate and the House, I'm urging that the Ukraine supplemental be added to that omnibus. Um, I think we ought to be proactively funding humanitarian relief for what will almost certainly end up being millions of Ukrainian refugees that will be hosted by Poland and Romania and Moldova and other countries already strained by the COVID pandemic and already at risk for further aggression by Russia. So I'm trying to balance that humanitarian investment with further defense investment. President Biden has already sent literally a billion dollars in military aid uh, to Ukrainian defenders. He's given them Stinger missiles to shoot down Russian jets, Javelin missiles to shoot at Russian tanks and ammunition and fuel and other support. But frankly, as this war in Ukraine continues, grinds along and gets more ugly, I think more and more of us are going to want to provide both the humanitarian support the Ukrainian people urgently need and the military support to sustain their defense against Putin's aggression. Beyond uh, money or any sort of funding measures, since you've been in the region so recently, what would you tell Americans should be the primary focus next? Well, the most important things that have happened in the last week is that after a year of investment by President Biden and his team in rebuilding our alliances, we've seen sanctions imposed on Russia that are unprecedented. Look, even in the Second World War, Switzerland and Sweden stayed neutral. Here, they've picked a side. They're imposing sanctions on Putin. Western Europe is closing their airspace. Sports leagues and teams are throwing the Russians out of their competitions. Financial sanctions have come down very hard, and we are targeting the oligarchs, the billionaires, who siphoned off the wealth of Russia and are hiding it in places like Monaco and London. Um, the unity of the Western alliance against Putin is striking, and it's the direct result of President Biden's hard work and leadership on this issue over the last year. Now, I noticed the president didn't mention Build Back Better. Uh, he instead took, you know, pieces and threads from it and yep. discussed that those things need to be passed. What are the odds that the Senate will take up those issues, even just one of them, like pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical drug prices? Well, I noticed that Senator Manchin stood up and was applauding vigorously at the idea that we should reduce prescription drug prices. Um, the president um, had a number of guests this evening, as did I. I think his guests were probably more important, but mine were important to me and to Delaware. And he highlighted Josh, a young man, I think from Ohio, actually, um, who's diabetic and who is struggling to afford the medications he so desperately needs. 
that's one of the things that I think President Biden also brought to the speech tonight. It was conversational at times. He was engaging the average American family saying, I know how hard this pandemic has been. And I know that even though we've got record job creation, record low unemployment, record economic growth, we've also got rising costs. So he's going to tackle things like health care costs, daycare and child care costs, and prescription medication costs. I was encouraged to see Senator Manchin cheering that particular one. All right. Senator Coons, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. Libby, I'll send it back to you. Thanks so much, Rhonda. Let's now bring in national video reporter Hannah Jewell. Now, Hannah's been tracking the Republican responses tonight from outbursts in the chamber to cheers to the official response from Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds. So, Hannah, did Governor Reynolds' speech contain any surprises? Well, I'd say that she really um, set up this big sort of heartland, Republican red heartland versus, you know, coastal elite Democratic sort of narrative, which is perhaps not a surprise. Uh, she did name check California, New Jersey and New York to sort of set up this thing, quite explicitly naming the um, the states of her critique. But we, we heard, as expected, she said that um, the she accused Biden and the Democrats of uh, taking us back in time, her words, to the late 70s and early 80s very sort of carefully critiquing there the uh, Carter years without encroaching on Ford or Reagan territory, uh, a time, um, as she had it, of, of inflation that she recalled being uh, basically working in a checkout counter at a grocery store and the pain of people uh, encountering inflation at in that time and saying that she relates that to this time. She made um, sort of speaking about Afghanistan and, and um, Ukraine, she made a sort of strange claim that Democrats were... Um, focusing on political correctness rather than military readiness. So you see her sort of, you know, hitting these popular culture war lines that are useful in an election. Um, she is actually facing an election quite soon. Um, and she said that the U.S. can't project strength abroad if we're weak at home. She critiqued the withdrawal from Afghanistan, saying that it emboldened our enemies. Um, but she also said that Americans should stand in solidarity with the brave people of um, Ukraine. She also, as expected, hit um, those lines about COVID, contrasting the response of Republican governors like herself to COVID with very few restrictions um, to those of Democratic governors and at the national level. She said the American people are waiting to exhale, speaking about masks. But, of course, we saw tonight almost everyone in Congress, Democrat, Democrats included, were not masked tonight in the chamber. Um, they were indeed exhaling uh, without masks. Um, and she really focused on children also and on parents, saying that what has happened to our children over the last few years is unconscionable. Um, she said that uh, the line of, of the night for her was parents matter. Republicans believe that parents matter, presumably a play on the phrase Black Lives Matter matter, um, talking about the right of parents to make decisions about COVID. Um, and that has been such a popular line for Republicans. Um, but again, really setting up this um, heartland versus, you know, Coastal Democrats line, a uh, tale as old as time in American politics, but certainly one that is still going strong. Anna, uh, let's go to James Homan for, for more on how potent this messaging is by Republicans. You know, we heard President Biden talk about in his speech tonight, James, acknowledging this has been uh, uh, a time of deep challenges and talking about yeah, how past my bedtime. Uh, I think we've still got <laughs> Hannah on. So let's turn off Hannah's mic. Uh, James, talking about how America can move forward with the pandemic. Uh, so, James, you know, is it this is it this opportunity for Republicans or is the opportunity passing them by? Well, Libby, I think that the, that message from Governor Reynolds was aimed at suburban women who traditionally voted Republican but backed Joe Biden in 2020 because they were uncomfortable with Donald Trump. And it's not like she would have said his name, but it was a very untrumpy speech that did not mention Donald Trump. It was kind of cool, calm, collected. It's the message that Republicans want to project. She's not someone who's going to be running for the Republican nomination in for president in 2024. She's not threatening to other rising figures in the Republican Party. I've known Kim Reynolds since she was a state senator uh, before she became lieutenant governor in 2011. And she delivered the kind of message, you know, there were obviously some culture war uh, box checking, kind of the elements that Hannah talked about. But overall, that was just about trying to reach these disaffected voters who they want to come home to the GOP in the midterms.
Thank you. Let's bring in national political correspondent Dave Weigel. Uh, Dave, thanks for hanging with us here uh, after the speeches. Uh, you've been covering the, the races across the country, the midterms, uh, long before they've been on anyone else's radar, really. So I want to talk to you first about the race in Texas tonight, today. This is a primary day in Texas. What can you tell us uh, about how things are shaping up and what we can read into those results? Well, and as it relates to the speech by the president tonight, uh, you had higher Republican enthusiasm than Democratic enthusiasm. We're still waiting some, for some Election Day votes. But you had uh, more turnout in Republican areas. You had a Republican turnout surge in South Texas, where uh, voters are majority Latino, but very unhappy with the president's immigration policy. And you had massive complications in big urban counties because of a voting uh, law that was passed last year. The president made a mention of, of, of passing voting reform but it was one of several things in the speech that you can imagine a interest group that supports the president being happy was mentioned, uh, but one that doesn't really have an active plan to get it through the Senate. Uh, so what, it, what happened in Texas so far is that uh, a, it's pretty clear that progressives won a seat that was designed to elect a Democrat in Austin, Texas. Now there's a November election in the 35th District of Texas, but Greg Kazar, who uh, was a champion of, of Austin's effort to cut police funding, uh, is probably going to win the Democratic nomination without a runoff, is probably heading to Congress. And you had, at the same time he was winning that, the president uh, very pointedly saying that he does not for defunding the police, a, a refrain of his, uh, that we need to fund the police. That's something that got a lot of cheers in the room, something got, I think, a little bit of a protest from, from Corey Bush of Missouri, talking about how the president has, has not fulfilled any clemency applications. So you saw a victory for the left at the same time that the president was moving away from the left on, on a couple of priorities. Not on the rest of it. I don't think you're going to hear many complaints from Democratic groups about what the president mentioned and what he didn't, with that exception. And the constituency for, quote unquote, to fund the police for that slogan within the party is, is really down to some people, uh, some academics who still support it, some, some activists who support it, but not really a voting constituency of the Democratic Party. Sherry, are you watching and listening for developments in Ukraine to impact how American voters are thinking about leadership? Was, was that a question for me? I'm sorry. It was, yes. Uh, <laughs> I missed the, the, top, the top of it. Uh, it hadn't so far in, te in Texas. Now, one development that might be related to this is that Morgan Luttrell, uh, a Navy SEAL who was running for a, another safe seat, almost everything in Texas at this point is a safe seat, uh, thanks to the new map, uh, is very close to winning without a runoff in a race that uh, even some of his supporters thought might go to a second round. He, he is a uh, decorated Navy SEAL, a, uh, a, was brought into the Trump administration by Rick Perry, and he faced this primary against a challenger who kept attacking him for having taken money from Adam Kinziger, linking him to the January 6th investigation, linking him to the effort uh, not to overturn the election. Uh, and that appears not to have worked at all. I think it could it could not have hurt Morgan Luttrell that the last week of the election, a lot of people were focused on Ukraine, on American strength abroad, on just basically real real issues impacting the fate of the people's lives around the world, and not on some of those pick a you issues. I think that that was helpful to him. I haven't seen much of that impact yet. People have uh, running for office. With a couple exceptions, they picked very popular ways to go after Russia. And you heard the president mention tonight uh, going after oligarchs' yachts, going after Russian oligarchs' property. You started to see some of that in campaigns, but the campaigns I've been seeing are more comfortable sticking to the issues they, they were already running on and maybe linking them to Ukraine. So Greg Abbott, who uh, won the governor's nomination uh, for a third term tonight, not a surprise, but a little bit more commanding than, than it looked at first, at the very end of the campaign is repeating this refrain that, uh, Joe Biden's more concerned with the Ukrainian border than the U.S.-Mexico border. That is going to be a theme in campaigns, at, at least at least for the time being. More than solidarity with Ukraine, the idea that the, the Biden administration is too focused on other countries and it's letting crime run rampant, drugs run through the country thanks to its inability to secure the border. That's more of a safe uh, space, a safe place for Republicans to campaign than anything else happening in Ukraine itself. Dave, we saw President Trump, former President Trump, defending Vladimir Putin. Uh, we saw him over the weekend really make his strongest indication that he may run for president in 2024. How much is he a factor right now in Republican uh, politics and, and what voters are looking for in leadership? Well, Texas this is a very good place to look at that. Uh, the president, uh, the former president, uh, endorsed a lot of people in these primaries. 
Uh, Ken Paxton, the attorney general, the most embattled Republican elected statewide, uh, is definitely going to make a runoff, is definitely going to be the leader heading into a runoff. The fact that Trump endorsed him uh, almost guaranteed that, and Trump, I think, will take credit. Uh, and if, if Paxton gets a runoff with George P. Bush, which is, which is frankly what he wanted, he was running ads against everyone in the race except for George P. Bush, uh, I, I don't know what, the, what, what Trump is going to do in that circumstance, but that was, that's kind of what Paxton's people wanted, remind people that there is a Trump-endorsed candidate versus a member of the Bush dynasty who couldn't get it. Uh, further down the ballot, uh, Trump endorsed a lot of candidates and I think helped them uh, get enough attention where they're going to avoid primaries, that, sorry, runoffs that include Sid Miller, the agriculture commissioner that includes uh, Monica De La Cruz, who is running for really the one swing seat in the state at the moment, running for the 15th district, which uh, c connects McAllen to the greater San Antonio area, about a four hour drive in between them. Um, she ran in 2020. She did very well because of the surge in South Texas. And and she looks like she's going to clear this, ra this race without a, run without a runoff while Democrats are going to get into runoff. There's a party switcher in the same area, this guy Ryan Guillen, who uh, a conservative Democrat in the Trump district switch parties. He's Latino. He's running ads about how he doesn't have to break the party anymore, how he supports Trump. He also looks like he's going to succeed. And if you uh, flip this a little bit, Republicans who had challenged Trump in any way, uh, and this, this is usually by questioning whether he should have been trying to overturn the election, they look to be surviving in Texas, but there is a, a substantial vote against them. You have Van Taylor, uh, a, co a congressman from, a, from another safe Republican seat, uh, is right on the edge of beating a runoff against um, uh, w some candidates with, with experience, but really a ballot that exists because he said that Biden won the election in 2020. That, that fueled the primary against him. Uh, you, you've seen in a, in a ju judicial race down the ballot, uh, it looks like an incumbent judge is going to win again, uh, win the Republican nomination for that seat again by at least 10 points. But the fact that he was being challenged was due to conservative activists within Texas complaining that he did not knew, do more to challenge the election results. So uh, a story in Texas over the next 12 weeks this is a very long runoff is going to be Ken Paxton, uh, not just the a Trump alley, not just the, the man behind this Texas lawsuit to overturn the electoral votes from Pennsylvania, him in a runoff with George P. Bush, as Paxton is also the face of this crackdown on, on parents of trans children. Uh, so you're going to have a conservative runoff uh, with Trump as a decisive factor in it. I think that is the place where Donald Trump is very happy to be, the idea that he remains completely control of the party and its narratives and its focus. All right, Dave, thank you so much. I want to bring James Homan in on this uh, to talk more about the midterms, because, James, it may feel like November is far away, but for President Biden and his team and for political operatives across the country, March 1st is a big day. Yeah, it's the start of the primary season. The midterms literally have begun uh, with this vote in Texas today. And this State of the Union will be much later than you typically would see a State of the Union March 1st. In fact, it's the first time in a century we've seen a State of the Union happen in March. And it, it's happening against the backdrop of these elections. I mentioned right after the speech ended that it seemed like Biden was preparing for divided government. And the, the numbers are pretty tough for Democrats. These are the, the Senate races in cycle. If you talk to any Democrat on Capitol Hill, they'll essentially acknowledge that the House is lost for them, that Republicans will control the House. But the 50-50 Senate, Democrats still have some hopes of caring, with Kamala Harris casting the tie-breaking vote. So these are all the races in cycle. And we can go to another graphic that shows the, really the competitive Senate races. And it's a lot of the states that are competitive in the presidential election. States Biden narrowly won in 2020. The Washington Post ABC News poll that came out this weekend showed that Republicans have a lead on the generic ballot. If you just generally ask voters, would you rather Republicans or Democrats control Congress? Republicans have a 49% to 42% lead. That's the same lead that Democrats had before the 2018 midterm elections, which were obviously huge for Democrats. If those numbers hold, you're very likely to see uh, Republican pickups in Georgia and Arizona and potentially Nevada and uh, potentially Wisconsin, New Hampshire, you could really see uh, a pretty significant Republican pickup. So that's why uh, you starting, you're starting to see President Biden, you know, he didn't talk about January 6th. He didn't talk about Donald Trump. He focused on these issues that he called the unity agenda on foreign policy. It's, a, it's about trying 
to improve his party's standing and preserve his Senate majority so that he's able to get more done during the, the last two years of his term. Mm, thank you so much, James. This is live coverage from The Washington Post of President Biden's State of the Union address. Uh, we've been talking a bit about politics in the midterm elections, but let's go back to the top of President Biden's speech. At the very beginning, he took time to acknowledge Ukraine's ambassador to the United States, who was attending as a guest of the First Lady. Let's watch. To every Ukrainian, their fearlessness, their courage, their determination literally inspires the world. Groups of citizens blocking tanks with their bodies, everyone from students to retirees to teachers, turned soldiers defending their homeland. And in this struggle, President Zelensky said in his speech to the European Parliament, light will win over darkness. The Ukrainian ambassador to the United States is here tonight sitting with the First Lady. Let each of us, if you're able to stand, stand and send an unmistakable signal to the world of Ukraine. Thank you. That's earlier tonight, uh, President Biden acknowledging the Ukrainian ambassador to the United States. Let's bring political reporter Joyce Ko back into the conversation. So, Joyce, we knew that Ukraine would be the top item here at the beginning of tonight's speech. Uh, what were the major takeaways about the president's message on that topic? Well, Libby, you heard the president say there during that moment, make a signal to the world. And really the world's eyes were on President Biden tonight as the Russian invasion in Ukraine intensifies. Typically the State of the Union is really directed at a domestic audience, but tonight President Biden knew that they would, there would be global eyes, uh, world leaders uh, around the globe watching to see what he had to say on the situation in Ukraine. He started off the speech by talking about his support for the people of Ukraine, uh, really emphasizing their courage in moments like we have seen on the ground there where Ukrainian people are standing up to Russian tanks. And then he talked about Vladimir Putin. He had some very pointed words for the Russian president. Take a bit, a listen to a bit of what he had to say. Six days ago, Russia's Vladimir Putin sought to shake the very foundations of the free world, thinking he could make it bend to his menacing ways. But he badly miscalculated. He thought he could roll into Ukraine and the world would roll over. Instead, he met with a wall of strength he never anticipated or imagined. He met the Ukrainian people. And this is just one of the many moments that we saw towards the beginning of the speech where a bipartisan group of lawmakers that really everyone in that chamber stood up to give a standing ovation to the message that President Biden had for Vladimir Putin and in support in support of the Ukrainian people uh, as they endure this uh, invasion of their country. Um, but he did make one clear distinction. Uh, President Biden is, of course, uh, the president who recently, just within the last year, um, pulled, withdrew all of the troops from Afghanistan. So he is someone who is very aware of how, how much of a war-weary nation we are. And he had a message uh, really directly uh, addressing that, saying that we will not be uh, at war with Ukraine, that we will not be directly, our forces will not be directly engaged in this conflict. But reiterating his support of Ukrainian people through humanitarian, economic, and military aid, saying that he has talked to uh, the president of Ukraine, uh, President Zelensky, about that humanitarian uh, and economic aid. Uh, and he said very plainly that our forces are not going to Europe to fight in Ukraine, uh, but he said that, quote, in the event that Putin decides to keep moving west, that he will continue to defend our NATO allies. Libby. Thank you so much, Joyce. Let's now go to Washington Post reporter Mariana Sotomayor, who was in the House chamber tonight to witness President Biden's State of the Union address in person. And she joins us now by phone. Mariana, thank you so much for taking a moment to talk with us. Uh, first of all, just give us a sense of what we weren't able to see and feel because we weren't there. What, what was it like to be in the chamber tonight? Well, it was very different from last year. And the main reason why is because Barely any members wore masks. If you remember last year, many members were separated from each other. Everyone in the chamber had to wear masks. 
and not many people attend it for that reason. So that's probably the number one thing uh, that, that I noticed very early on. I'm sure you all saw that many members were wearing the colors of the Ukrainian flag. Um, but even before that, you know, we actually saw uh, a Republican congressman, Brian Fitzpatrick, handing out the Ukrainian flag, which many members actually waved during those bipartisan moments that Biden talked about, backing Ukraine at every possible step. And there were other times when Republicans actually did join Republicans, or sorry, join Democrats in, in giving Biden that standing ovation. It was any time that he spoke about, you know, building more technology and, 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 and resources here in the U.S. And surprisingly, really the first times that we saw Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene and also Lauren Boebert, um, two very pro-Trump allies, stand up and cheer were when Biden actually mentioned the fact that, you know, we are all against defunding the police. Um, and also when they when Biden said that there is necessary um, things to address when it comes to immigration reform. Uh, so, Mariana, you, you mentioned Congresswoman Boebert. Let's talk about her outburst uh, as the president was speaking. What, what was it like uh, to, to witness that? And what was the reaction by everyone else in the chamber? Yeah, you know, it was interesting because they were sitting very close to each other and they were also sitting with a number of Republican freshmen. And for the most part, they sat down a lot. And many reporters were watching them because they were talking amongst each other, laughing at times when Biden would say something. We couldn't audibly hear them from where we were. But of course, the one outburst came from Boebert towards the end when Biden started to talk about Iraq and Afghanistan. And he actually was talking about the fact that many veterans had come home to the U.S. after those wars and developed cancer and found themselves, as Biden put it, draped um, with the American flag over their coffin. And at that point is when Boebert actually yelled, essentially blaming Biden, that it was his fault. And he mentioned, you know, you, you killed 13 Americans. And she was referencing the 13 uh, Americans that died last year when Biden uh, withdrew a number of troops from Afghanistan. And that's something that Republicans continually have hit Biden on. That was probably the most notable part. But, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene also was heckling in some at, at some points with some members saying, you know, sit down or, or, or be quiet. All right, Mariana Sotomayor, thank you so much. You know, James, um, in a way, it serves their purpose because we're talking about those members of Congress who chose not to comport themselves with respect tonight. Um, so let, let's talk about where things go from here. What will you be watching in terms of the collegiality, the ability to get things done, even if you disagree, the ability to work together in ways that uh, we saw some unity uh, on tonight in the State of the Union? Well, it, it got less attention than Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene, but I noticed that Joe Manchin sat with Mitt Romney on the Republican side of the aisle. And it's a reminder that it's a 50-50 you know, Senate. They need every Democrat to pass anything on party lines. Uh, you know, the president avoided using the term Build Back Better because Joe Manchin has made clear he's not going to vote for anything called Build Back Better. The first rule of these states of the union, Libby, as you know, is do no harm. And President Biden didn't do anything to hurt himself tonight. He has a 37 percent approval rating, the lowest of his presidency. And he's trying to win back people who voted for him in 2020. And if they were watching those first 10 minutes about Ukraine and those last 10 minutes about the unity agenda, it, it seems probable that he will make inroads with some of those independent voters and, and never Trump Republicans. On the other hand, these states of the unions don't lead to the kind of bounce in the polls that presidents used to be able to count on. So we'll, we'll see in the coming days uh, how much breaks through, especially amid Ukraine, President Biden flying tomorrow to Superior, Wisconsin, to have an event to try to continue hammering on some of these key themes. All right, thank you so much, James. Let's go to Rhonda Colvin on Capitol Hill for final thoughts tonight. Rhonda. Yeah, there's a mix of so many um, crucial issues facing this administration as well as this Congress. And from what I'm hearing, 
from uh, people on the Hill. In fact, between the times you came to me, I've been trying to speak to members because we had a line of people who wanted to talk to us. Uh, but of course, we can't be on all night. But uh, it appears that so many people, Republicans and Democrats, they are, are here to support Ukraine. Off camera, some told me that they are gravely concerned about the next few days and weeks ahead in Ukraine. So it looks like there is certainly unity there. And we saw the president tap into that unity. But of course, it's that domestic agenda. I just spoke to a Republican congressman who talked about some of the issues he had with uh, the uh, President Biden's uh, energy policies. And it just seems like that domestic uh, proposals that the president has are still in flux. They still need to be sold to a, a divided Senate. So there's a lot to watch in the next coming days, months, uh, and including uh, the trail to the midterms. That's what's also on so many people's minds right now. The House has had a bit of a record number of people, Democrats, who have decided not to seek re-election. So there is some concern there that this really could be a Republican can controlled house uh, after this next election. So a confluence of so many issues happening here on Capitol Hill. But from what I'm hearing, uh, if I were to summarize tonight, so many members are behind the president on Ukraine. It's just those domestic issues that are really going to take some time. Uh, and we, we, the question still remains, will they ever be accomplished? Rhonda Colvin. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our guests tonight and to you, our audience. Thank you for watching President Biden's first State of the Union address with the newsroom of The Washington Post. Please stay tuned to The Washington Post as we continue to cover Russia's attack of Ukraine and all other breaking news stories. I'm Libby Casey. Have a good and safe night. Sometimes you have to see to believe and witness history as it unfolds. When the news is breaking, watch with the newsroom of The Washington Post. We explain what's happening and why it matters. Thank you for choosing to watch the headlines as they're being written by our journalists. You can subscribe with a special offer at WashingtonPost.com watch. Subscribing through that link lets everyone here from the front lines to the control room know that you care about our continued efforts to inform the public, protect the First Amendment, and foster a healthy democracy. We could not do this without you.